All right, we're on the record. <laughs> All right, very good. Good morning. It's June 5th, 2023. Assessment Appeal Board number two is hereby called to order. Brendan, would you do roll? Yes, Board Member uh, Lunetta. Present. Board Member Cam. Present. Board Member Little. Present. Thank you. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Will our presenters today please remain standing? I'm going to place you under oath. Please raise your right arm. You need each of you to solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give and the matters now pending before this board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. You may now be seated. All right. Are there any public comments other than what's on the agenda today? Chair Little, there are no members of the public present in person or on Zoom to address the board. Thank you. All right. Any board comments? None? All right, we will proceed. We only have one agenda item today, and that's application 201791, <coughs> Well Tower Property Group, LLC. Yes, Chair Little, um, I have handed out a copy of the application as well as the applicant's exhibits 16 through 29. Uh, findings of fact have been requested by the applicant. Um, if you're uh, just for clarification as to why it's starting at 16, there was a prior hearing on December 5th, uh, 2021, where applicant exhibits 1 through 15 and assessors exhibits A and B were submitted. Uh, this is um, a bifurcated uh, portion of that, so we'll be starting fresh with the evaluation today. Uh, but they may, uh, the parties may reference the prior exhibits, so um, they were instructed to begin their exhibits accordingly. Um, so those have been submitted, and this is a January 1st, um, 2021, uh, sorry, 2020 market value appeal, and we're all set. All righty. And to the assessor who carries the burden of proof. Hello, uh, Joe Phillips with the Ventura County Assessor's Office. It would be the applicant that carries the burden since this is a commercial property. All right, the reason I ask that, that determines who does their presentation first. So I'm gonna get just a brief overview from the assessor as to the issues, and then we'll have the applicant do their presentation. To the assessor. All right, thank you. Um, so today we are discussing the property located at 190 Tierra Rajada Road in Simi Valley. This is an assisted living facility. Um, this is a 97 bed assisted living facility. Um, the subject provides assisted living services and memory care services. Uh, the subject was completed construction in 2009. Uh, the owner of the property is Well Tower Inc., which is a publicly traded real estate trust, uh, real estate investment trust, known as a REIT. Uh, today, we are discussing the value as of January 1st, 2020. Uh, an appeal was filed um, based in its, the applicant's position that the value is lower than the enrolled value as of January 1st, 2020. Um, and I believe that would sum up our uh, summary. All right, uh, before we begin, just for the record, the application shows the applicant's opinion of value at eleven million two hundred and eight thousand nine fifty eight. Is that correct? No, it's been amended. Okay. To uh, we're going to be stipulating to a value, not stipulating. Sorry, uh, arguing for a value of twelve million eight hundred eighty seven thousand five hundred and thirty four. Okay, very good. And that'll be on one of the exhibits that we'll go over. All right, you may proceed. Thank you. For the record, this is Dan Tobias with Tobias and Associates. And Christopher Tobias with Tobias and Associates. All right, so you have in front of you exhibits uh, 16 through 29. Um, I have not yet given out the table of contents. I'll be doing that at the end because we have additional exhibits uh, that we're going to be presenting during rebuttal. Um, so we'll be starting on exhibit 16. If you go over exhibit 16, tab 16, there's a few pictures of the property. Uh, just for reference to see what we're talking about here. As the assessor's office stated, um, 
I'm not sure of the exact construction date, but the uh, date that the property was opened as an assisted living facility was November 1st of 2009. Uh, we do show as a 97 bed, uh, 80 unit property that has independent assisted, sorry, independent living, assisted living. Um, there's also um, memory care. Uh, it's now called reminiscence care. And once you've gone over, hold on. Exhibit 16, uh, if you scroll over to Exhibit 17, tab 17, um, the first page is a copy of the rent roll. Don't worry, I've got a blown up version on page two. So uh, first two pages of Exhibit 17 are copies of the rent roll showing, I believe, 91 um, residents uh, occupied the property as of December 31st of 2019. It shows their um, the rents that they pay. They also pay a number of care charges as well. And so this is basically a copy of the rent roll, and we'll go over that, and that's something that we provide to the assessor's office. Uh, so page two and three are just blown up versions of that rent roll. It's a very long document, so we had to bifurcate it to blow it up so you can actually read it. Page four, um, you'll now have a uh, column and row headers, and that's the beginning of the 2019 um, profit and loss statement. And that page goes over the occupancy stats, and you see there um, the actual occupancy as of December 31st of 2019 was 91.7%, uh, so the property was in stabilization. You need an occupancy with 90.6%. Um, you scroll to the next, the first page is just a lot of operating stats that don't mean much after without the context of the revenues and expenses. So if you scroll to the next page, you'll see a copy, or sorry, you'll see the beginning of the revenue line items. Highlighted there is uh, a little bit of the detail from the revenues, uh, room rents of $3,991,829 uh, for the full year of 2019. Uh, you go down to column X, uh, row 245, uh, total net revenues of 7407163 um, Then it begins the, uh, the operating expenses with labor on row 246, and you scroll to the next page. Um, more of the operating, operating expenses, uh, column X, row 480, sorry, 490 is the house profit. That's 1,964,311. Uh, they've also got uh, management expenses that they pay to Sunrise to manage the property. Uh, Sunrise doesn't rent the property. They manage it for a, for a management fee. Um, also some other non-operating expenses there. I uh, scroll to the next page, row X, um, uh, sorry, column X, row 511. Uh, net operating income before any rule eight adjustments of 1,208,580. And this is where we start our rule eight adjustments on our uh, property tax rule eight. Um, they basically want you to get to uh, EBITDAR, which is earnings for interest taxes. Um, amortization and rent. So under Rule 8, we add back the property taxes on row 534 of $244,525. Under Rule 8, it also um, requests a deduction for a return on working capital. And I'll go over these in the next pages about how I calculated a couple of these items. But uh, row 535 is our return on working capital. Uh, we assumed a 3% rate of return. It's like a money market account. Um, for three months of working capital of uh, $46,697. Um, Rule 8 and uh, Revenue Taxation Code Section 110 also requires you to deduct intangibles. Uh, so as an assisted living facility, they have a significant value in the workforce. Uh, Assessor's Handbook 502, I believe, goes over um, one of those intangibles as being a workforce in place. And so under Rule 8, it says that you have to deduct a return on those um, intangible assets. And so we took the, the capitalization rate as a rate of return estimate and uh, deducted 
uh, use that as a rate of return on the labor expenses to deduct out uh, $267,728 uh, for the value of uh, the workforce in place. And then um, under Rule 8, it also requires you to deduct a capital reserves allowance. Um, we used, I can go over the detail on that, but we deducted $223,046. On an annual basis, these properties uh, replace a lot of flooring, uh, tile, they do a lot of renovations. Um, they gotta keep the property up to date on a yearly basis uh, to, to draw the room revenues uh, for the residents. And so that happens pretty much annually. Um, and that's reported annually on the uh, 571L forms uh, for the business personal property returns. And so after a capitalization rate of 7.1%, uh, we come to a direct capitalization value under rule rate of $12,887,534. And you scroll to the next page. <clears throat> um, this is our uh, calculation on the capitalization rate. Um, from a CBRE Senior Housing Market Insight, uh, first quarter of 2020, we got a range uh, for the capitalization rate, and I can go over that in a minute. Um, it's a different exhibit, um, but it basically has the class and then the uh, ranges for independent living, uh, assisted living, memory care. So if we found the appropriate um, estimate for this particular property. It was about 6% for the capitalization rate. Um, and then under Rule 8, you're supposed to add back the tax rate um, so we get an overall capitalization rate of 7.1%. And you go to the next page. And this is the return on working capital. I can go over that in Rule 8 because um, not a lot of counties pay much attention to it, but uh, we make sure to get it. Um, so return on working capital, you take the operating expenses and uh, roughly, it came to fruition during COVID too. Uh, because a lot of, a lot of um, counties would argue that, you know, you don't really need any working capital on hand to pay your expenses. Um, during COVID, uh, a lot of these facilities, uh, operations went down and became uh, too realistic about how quickly the uh, cash flows ran out to pay all their expenses. Um, one of the items was trying to get um, property tax payments for April of 2020 postponed. Um, it was especially difficult for hotels that had to completely shut down. So. It's in Rule 8, I can point it out to you in a moment in a different exhibit, um, but uh, we have a rate of return of about 3%. So it's basically, the assumption is that um, properties of this type have cash on hand to make sure that they can make payroll, uh, pay their vendors on time. And under Rule 8, it says you have to deduct um, an allowance, <clears throat> excuse me, an allowance for a return on that account. 3% um, these days is actually a low money market rate of return these days, it's actually around 5%, 4 or 5%. Um, so return on working capital, we have a deduction for $46,697.14. Um, go to the next page, workforce in place. <clears throat> I can go over the assessor's handbook on the discussion of this um, item. It's specifically listed as one of the intangibles uh, to be considered for deduction um, under Rule 8 and an income approach. Um, and it's also where we have a court case that goes over uh, workforce in place is SHC Half Moon Bay versus San Mateo County specifically addressed workforce in place. I have that exhibit included here as well that I can go over. Um, so labor expenses, um, you assume that the property is not just um, trying to get a return of their expenses, they also have to get a return on their expenses, otherwise they'd just be breaking even. Um, so we've got the rate of return. We assume the cap rate as the rate of return. Uh, return on workforce in place, we have a deduction of $267,727.91. Um, another way to think of it is uh, every January 1st, the facility doesn't have to start off with a skeleton property. They have the workforce in the prior year that's been trained, um, especially now with labor shortages. It's extremely difficult to get new employees, especially trained employees that are qualified. So um, just imagine if every year they had to start with nobody, um, they would lose a lot of money. Uh, these properties are very high, high in uh, services. So those employees are very important. <clears throat> and then under section 110, um, what they say about these intangibles that you gotta identify, um, 
hire and train and retain the workforce. And so that's part of that calculator, part of that assumption and that deduction. Uh, next page is capital reserves allowance. Um, we've seen it a number of different ways. Um, I, can, well, I have the actuals because they have actual capital reserves every year and it fluctuates significantly with these properties. Um, but you know, for example, in San Diego County, we used actual capital reserve allowance and they didn't like it. They wanted to use 5% of revenues. Um, we've seen some counties use 3% of revenues. Um, seems that they just want to take the lesser of any of those calculations. So uh, we've gone conservative here um, and used 3% of revenues. Um, capital reserves allowance here is $223,045.95. Um, I, I handle myself a lot of uh, business personal property filings every year, and that's, I would say, very reasonable. Um, they fluctuate significantly. One year you could have a couple hundred thousand, the next year you could have over a million dollars. Um, it's kind of remarkable, but they go through this every year. Um, you got to think it's over, and what they, how they explain it is whenever there's a turnover in unit, they're going to remodel the unit. And so and they also have to make sure that the uh, common areas are up to, up to date. Um, just imagine you're taking your... Uh, your family member to visit one of these properties. You don't want worn out furniture, worn out floors. They got to replace it pretty consistently. <clears throat> and then exhibit 18, it's just the detail from the from their actual capital reserve expenses from 2018, 19, and 20. Um, so if you go to the bottom of page two, uh, their net capital reserve expenses for 2018 was about $201,000. Um, and you go to page three, bottom of page three. Uh, that year for 2019, they spent $738,800 on capital expenditures. Um, you can go through the list of descriptions there. It it's, includes equipment, um, and, you know, there's computers, there's equipment, there's furniture, there's laundry, there's kitchen equipment. Um, Items like that. And then the next page is the 2020 detail. It's a little bit past the, uh, past the lean date, but that's just there for an example uh, that it fluctuates. It's $106,236. Um, so we thought that the 3% was a conservative estimate for capital reserves. Exhibit 19 is a copy of the uh, first quarter 2020 uh, CBRE report for Senior Housing Market Index. And I highlighted there how we got the cap rate. It's a class B property in our opinion. Um, I mean, if you've seen a class A, you know it. Um, we, we've got clients that have properties in um, Arizona that are hundreds of units, brand new, um, pools, tennis courts, um, movie theaters, um, you know, up, very large dining rooms, very large kitchens. This is a relatively smaller unit. Um, it's not brand new. There's a lot of uh, a lot of inventory in the market right now for senior housing properties. So. That's why we wouldn't consider it a class A. So under class B, if you look at the rows for uh, core assisted living and memory care, um, there's mostly assisted living here, but there is some memory care. And you see the range uh, there of the lows and the highs. <clears throat> lows are four to 5%, highs are eight to 9%. And if you're not familiar with cap rates, the higher the cap rate, um, the lower the resulting value. The lower the cap rate, the higher the value. And so we looked at the averages there, and uh, California usually has, usually um, gets a lower cap rate, especially depending on the area. Um, so Ventura is, you know, it's not, it's going to be lower than the average for the uh, for the industry, but it's not going to be um, like San Francisco. San Francisco gets much lower rate, um, whether you agree with it or not. Um, so we got uh, we assumed a value or sorry a cap rate of about six percent, which is below the average on both, and then we added in the tax rate if you recall from that schedule. Exhibit twenty is just a copy of the twenty twenty tax bill where we got the tax rate for that calculation. Um, exhibit twenty one is a discussion from the assessor's handbook over the appropriateness of an income approach. Um, one of the assumptions is that the value is a function of income. In this property, that is the case. Uh, value depends on the size, shape, duration, and risk of the income. And future income is less valuable than present income, which is all true for this property. Um, you scroll, uh, go to exhibit 22. 
This is a discussion from the Assessor's Handbook on intangible assets. And the portion I highlighted mentions, um, you know, I mentioned before that the properties, you have to assume that the property is not just trying to make uh, break even. They have to make a return of their expenses and on their expenses. Otherwise, they would just be breaking even if they're not making a rate of return on their expenses. And so this is similar to what's discussed in the Assessor's Handbook. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that's a separate page. But this mentions that uh, a lot of intangibles, especially if they're self-created, aren't listed on any financials. Um, under GAAP, there's no procedure for booking self-created uh, intangibles. Um, so we have some counties that, that, that try to argue that it's not listed on the income statement or the balance sheet, um, so it doesn't exist, and uh, that's just not the case. The assessor's handbook here discusses this. Um, it says many intangible assets and rights that they may exist will not be shown on a company's books. Examples include vendor relationships, brand recognition, customer loyalty, et cetera, and more even if intangible assets and rights are shown on a company's books, uh, the company's balance sheet may not reflect the fair market value of those intangible assets and rights. And so, for instance, if a property, or sorry, if a uh, if a taxpayer acquires an intangible asset like a vendor list, um, five years down the line, ten years down the line, that's that booked uh, that that cost that's booked on their balance sheet that's then depreciated is not going to be the market value in five, ten years. They've changed it, they've developed it. It's totally different. That's just for gap accounting purposes to account for depreciation. <clears throat> and then you scroll to the next page. Uh, Assessor's Handbook gives uh, examples of the intangible assets and rights. Uh, the major one in this particular property is workforce in place. It's listed there on the bottom right. <clears throat> and then you scroll. And then the remainder of that exhibit is just further discussion from the Assessor's Handbook and the State Board of Equalization on intangibles. Uh, related to uh, properties, and I just included that just in case. Um, go to Exhibit 23. Here it says, uh, the value of intangible assets and rights cannot be removed by merely deducting the related expenses from the income stream to be capitalized. Um, footnote on the bottom, investors demand both the return of their investment or a recapture of their investment and a return on their investment or a yield on their investment. Uh, allowing a deduction for the associated expense does not allow for a return on the capital expenditure. For example, allowing the deduction of wages paid to a skilled workforce does not remove the value of the workforce in place from the income indicator because the amount of the wages paid does not necessarily represent a return on, of or, and on the workforce in place and further bears no relationship to the cost associated with locating, interviewing, training, and otherwise acquiring the workforce. Similarly the, similarly, the deduction of management fee from the income stream of a hotel does not recognize or remove the value attributable to the business enterprise that operates the hotel. And you'll see in a moment, uh, the SHC Half Moon Bay case uh, against San Mateo County. San Mateo County argued that uh, deduction of the management fee accounted for the value of the workforce. Um, Courts ruled against that and said it doesn't account for a return on those expenses. <clears throat> Exhibit 24 is a copy of that case. Uh, one, two. I highlighted a section, so let me figure out which page it is. Oh, yeah, page numbers are up top. <clears throat> if you go to page 15, bottom right, No, uh, so the assessor's expert conceded that the assessor's approach didn't remove all the intangible assets and rights. Um, he said that it got a majority of it, but um, acknowledged that the addition to the, that an additional deduction for market rate management and franchise fee should be deducted. Um, Callahan admitted other components such as labor in place should be deducted in addition to the management and franchise fee. Um, <clears throat> Callahan's report and, and testimony before the board demonstrated this methodology used by the assessor and approved by the board. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to trying to summarize it for you, so I don't have to go through each page. Um, scroll to page seventeen. <clears throat> Uh, the board's own appraisers admitted that they did not attempt to identify any intangible assets, but instead ignored the detailed evidence produced by Sprint in the case, which identified and separately valued numerous intangible assets. The same is true here. <coughs> I think you get the idea on that case. Exhibit 25. And this is just 
to show you that we didn't, uh, you know, this methodology is used um, almost exclusively in the senior housing market. Um, and we've got a lot of clients that are constantly looking at acquisitions of new senior housing properties. And <clears throat> the main item that they're uh, interested in is net operating income and trying to determine what, because that's the main bread and butter of, the, of these properties is what residents are paying and what the expenses are to run the facility. Um, and so just to back up this approach on top of having Rule 8, um, we, we found an outside third party, Haven Senior Investment. Um, it describes how they view the market and the income capitalization approach. It says that uh, this is the most common valuation method used to assess the market value of existed stabilized senior living facilities. Uh, this method evaluates revenues, expenses, and net operating income. It looks at the total revenue generated by the business and the operational expenses. In simpler terms, the NOI of a facility is the cash flow of the business, which can be defined as either the actual historical earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, it's EBITDA, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, but after a management fee and appropriate replacement reserves, we did both, or a capital expenditure program. Since most of these transactions include sales with both real estate and business operations, the NOI figure is also calculated without including a lease payment. <coughs> You go to exhibit 26. Uh, this is rule two, which uh, governs what the definition of full cash value is. Um, describes full cash value as the unencumbered or unrestricted fee simple interest in the real property. <clears throat> if you scroll a couple more pages um, to, hold on. I have a copy of rule eight in here. Page five, it's a copy of rule eight. It goes over the definition of gross return and gross outgo. Gross return means any money or money's worth which the property will yield over and above vacancy and collection loss. <clears throat> gross outgo means any outlay of money or money's worth including current expenses and capital expenditures or an allowance, annual allowances thereof which are required to develop and maintain the estimated income. I discussed earlier, every year they've got to go do capital replacements to make sure the property's up to date. That's what it's referring to right there for this particular property. Uh, gross outgo does not include amortization, depreciation, or depletion charges, debt retirement interest on funds, or rents and loyalties payable to the SSE for use of the property. Um, property taxes, corporate net income taxes, and corporate uh, franchise taxes are also excluded from gross outgo. Um, in valuing property encumbered by a lease, the net income to be capitalized is the amount the property would yield were it not so encumbered. Uh, that's the issue of uh, fee simple interest. <clears throat> um, if you scroll down to paragraph E, income derived from rental of properties is preferred to income derived from their operations since income derived from operations is more likely to be influenced by managerial skills and may arise in part from non-taxable property and other resources. Uh, this is a unique uh, situation where the business of the property is renting the property to residents. Um, so those rental receipts are reflected on the net operating income. So that's why you have to take the net operating income and then uh, identify, quantify, and deduct any intangibles that you would see um, affecting that cash flow. <clears throat> and here's the portion from our additional deductions. It says when income from operating property is used, sufficient income shall be excluded to provide a return on working capital and other non-operating assets such as workforce in place to compensate unpaid or underpaid management. I'm gonna give you a, I already told you, I'm gonna give you a table of contents in the end that'll go over what each exhibit is. Um, exhibit 27 is uh, some discussion on comparable sales. Um, I went over this because uh, a, lot of, a lot of counties like to do comparable sales on these properties and the issue with comparable sales is the reported sales prices on these properties includes the business value. And unless you're involved in the sale, you can't identify how much of the sales price is for the business versus what is for the real estate. Um, so we don't use that uh, because it, it's just too unreliable. Um, Assessor's Handbook here, I include this as adjustments for non-real property items included in the purchase. Um, 
which basically says that you have to identify those intangible assets and deduct them before you use them as a comparable sale in the uh, comparative sale analysis. Um, exhibit 28, further discussion on the comparable sales approach. Um, the appraiser is free to use, hold on. If the subject property was part of a sale of a business enterprise, the appraiser may wish to examine transaction documents which may contain an allocation of the purchase price to the various components. Appraisers should be aware that this allocation may or may not be made based on fair market value. It's like what I said earlier, uh, gap accounting is not necessarily appropriate for property tax purposes. Um, also, we don't have access to transaction docu transactional documents on comparative, comparable sales, um, so we don't use that approach. Uh, exhibit 29 is another, oh, that's just the rule um, under property tax rule four that discusses what's required under rule four for a comparable sales approach. And it basically just lists out all the adjustments you're supposed to make, including, um, you know, it mentions you know, business related adjustments and we just can't get that information. A lot of those are always usually confidential. Um, and then that concludes our case in chief. All righty, are there any questions from the assessor to the applicant? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Tobias, my name is Brett McMurdo. I'm with Ventura County Council. I represent the assessor's office. I'm gonna ask you a few questions. I'll only take five or 10 minutes. Um, we'll proceed from there. Now, the operating expenses that are set forth in your presentation that set, for, set forth the basis of your valuation are for only the subject property, correct? Yes. The profit and loss statements that you produce from 2017 to 2019 were for the subject property only? I didn't provide 2017 through 2018 on my case in chief. I provided 2019. Those so for 2019? Product. Yes. Okay. Um, and you would agree that operating expenses should be estimated at a market level, correct? Um, I'm not, I don't understand your question. What do you mean estimated? Uh, we're looking at actuals. Um, for purposes of your valuation of the, the subject property? Yes, for a stabilized property, uh, we assumed for a stabilized property that the historical performance was market performance. Was market performance? Yes. And what did you rely on um, in terms of determining um, whether the historical data was market performance? Property's uh, occupancy is 91.7%. That's comparatively high. Um, it's stabilized. Um, it's been operating since 2009. Um, this is before COVID, so there weren't any uh, extenuating circumstances. Um, to assume that it was not operating, especially with such a high occupancy rate. But isn't that for just the subject property? Yeah, the appeal is for the subject property. Now, I'd like you to please take a look at Exhibit 25 in your um, presentation. I'm gonna refer you to a page, sir, page two of 14. What exhibit? It's Exhibit 25. Yeah. Second paragraph here, which is really the first full paragraph, it starts, if the historical income has been consistent and steady. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. So it says, if the historical income has been consistent and steady within the normal industry and regional operating and net income ratios, a capitalization rate, cap rate, would then be applied to the histor historical net operating income to derive a value estimate. You would agree that this is saying that um, the historical income needs to take into account the industry itself, so market value, correct? Um, we're considering the property as a market participant, so uh, I'm not sure what your question, well, I'm not sure of your question. Um, so my question is, in the questions that we just went through with respect to historical um, data for the subject property, I believe you testified that the 97% rate going back to 2009 was just for the subject property. Is that accurate? 91% occupancy, correct. 91%? Yes. Okay. Would you agree that this is saying we have to go beyond the subject property and look at the industry as a whole? Uh, I, don't, I don't read into that that it says we have to go beyond actual performance, no. Now, 
you never checked the subject property's operating expenses against other 27 to 2017 to 2019 operating expense data from comparable properties, correct? Uh, we didn't have access to non-Sunrise properties' net operating income. Okay. So and, no. and, uh, and there are also different markets. So different markets yield different rates, different incomes, different expenses. It varies. So you can't, it's not apples to apples. Um, there's too many ifs trying to say one property makes, you know, X dollar amount and another property makes X dollar amount. But to my question, you didn't rely on any comparable properties? No. Your valuation doesn't rely on market income, right? From comparable uh, rentals on the market? No, it relies on actual income. And your valuation doesn't rely on a rental rate prevailing in the market for comparable properties? It relies on the, on the rent roll. Um, from the 91 units that lists the uh, average or the rental rates per day, and if I recall correctly, a majority of them were at or above the target rental rate per day, and then the other amounts were a little bit below the target amount, but it nets out to roughly target amount per day. The, the 91 units that are all at the subject property, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The residents. The residents that were occupied. Now. You are familiar, as you've discussed, with property tax rule eight, correct? The income approach to value? I am. And um, just for reference, this is on the Assessor's Exhibit G, page 12 of 28. I don't have Assessor's Exhibit G in front of me. Do you have we, a copy of it? And we don't have that yet. Um, That's also in the applicant's Exhibit 25, page. I believe 26, page. Oh, 26, page one. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Page five, rule eight. 26 page. All right. Yeah, can I see that? Yeah. Okay, so um, you're familiar with property tax rule eight? I am. So you're aware that recently derived income and recently negotiated rents of the subject property and comparable properties should be used in estimating the future income if reasonably indicative of the income the property will produce at the highest and best level? What's your question about that paragraph? I'm just, the question is if, if you are aware that that's what property tax rule eight says. Yes, that's paragraph E. And you would agree that property tax rule eight subdivision E, so toward the bottom of that page, says that per, for purposes of valuation, income derived from rental of properties is preferred to income derived from their operation, since income derived from operation is more likely to be influenced by managerial skills and may arise in part from non-taxable property or other sources? Uh, yes, I went over that in my case. Um, these the subject uh, business is in the business of renting units uh, by month. Um, so the net operating income is a reflection of uh, rental rates uh, and rental receipts on a monthly basis from residents. And the issue with that is that if you don't deduct intangibles and you just value the property off net operating income that are affected by possible managerial skills, you might overassess the property. And so that's why we deducted intangibles to make sure we did not overassess the property by just using straight net operating income. You're familiar with the assessor's handbook, correct? Which one? Uh, section 502. Uh, section 502? I'm sorry. Um, uh, assessor's Handbook 502. Yes. So you'd agree that um, Assessor's Handbook 502 states income and expenses are estimated on a market basis? I'm not sure what section you have. To, can you show it to me so I can see the context of it? I don't know what we it. have in here. Um, yeah, me if we can't produce it for We're just taking a quick look to see if there's anything, if we can find it in, uh, in um, Our your guys' exhibits here. I'll just move on. Um, sir, does the subject property have a lease? Um, they rent units to residents. I'm sorry, say it again? They rent units to residents. 
Is it typical for assisted living facilities to have triple net leases? Um, it does occur. It is becoming less common since 2007 when RIDEA passed. Did you research any triple net leases in constructing your valuation of the subject property? No, because that transaction doesn't occur in the subject property. Um, did you compare your value conclusion against the value conclusion using triple net market rents as a test of reasonableness? No, because that transaction doesn't happen at the subject property. So, so your answer is no? No. Okay, okay I'm almost done here. Um, now, sir, during your presentation, you referred to um, deductions calculated pertaining to return on working capital, workplace and force, and capital reserves. You recall that? Yes. How did you determine that these were accurate ways of calculating these deductions? Do you have a specific question about, about which calculation? You know, let's start with um, return on working capital. So the assessor's handbook discusses, for, the, for instance, um, for items like these, you're supposed to use basically common sense and financial theory to uh, come up with a reasonable analysis for those deductions. And so um, the assessor's handbook doesn't provide specifically a, an exact calculation for those deductions. There is one for work for, for sorry for return on working capital, and I recall the they give an example in the mining uh, assessor's handbook, and it does a similar calculation where they estimate a monthly um, working capital, and then they take a deduction of a return on that amount, um, is what the example is in the assessor's handbook. And so, um, you know, we know with working in the market that there is a work for, uh, sorry, a working capital allowance that they have to have on hand. Um, the assessor's handbook says that you have to deduct a return on it. Um, we've got market rates of return for money market accounts, and so um, it is reasonable to assume that um, a money market account is not earning 0% interest rate um, so in order to follow uh, Rule 8, Paragraph E, um, you have to apply those rates of return to uh, deduct a sufficient income uh, for a return on working capital. Thank you. And, and I'm going to ask the, the same question for uh, workforce in place. Workforce in place is uh, another issue where the assessor's handbook discusses and says that you have to deduct for it, but they don't provide a specific deduction approach for it. Um, so. In the absence of an actual calculation, um, different counties have deducted it different ways. Um, for instance, San Francisco County deducts it the exact way our office does. Um, we've had experience in other counties where they've accepted our approach, uh, where you take the, um, you know, there's another approach where you take the workforce in place and you assume that it would take about three months to replace. Um, given current the current market, three months to replace it is significantly short. Um, so uh, with labor shortages, um, it's more accurate, we believe, to assume that you're gonna make a rate of return on your workforce. Um, and so under Rule 8, uh, rate of return on your workforce, that's how we get to the deduction. Thank you, and then uh, finally, sir, just with respect to capital reserves. Capital reserves, uh, we have actual capital reserves on an annual basis. Um, so you can look at those annual capital reserves. As I said in my, uh, in my case, um, some counties like to use actuals if they're low. Some counties like to use 5% uh, of revenues if it's low. Um, we've used 3% of revenues. Um, we think that's conservative compared to the actual capital expenditures of the property. Um, and again, under Rule 8E, it says you have to deduct for a, a reserve on capital expenditures that happens every year. Um, it's reported to the assessor's office annually on the 571L report. Thank you. If I may, prior to the assessor presenting their case, if that's completed, can, can we just have a one minute recess to, to discuss amongst ourselves here an issue? We're, we're still we're working sure. on one issue real quick. But, okay, um, we'll just take okay. a uh, five minute recess. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So return at 10, uh, 20, 1025. 1025. Thank you. <laughs>
Chair Little, we just have a, a couple additional questions. Go right ahead. We're back on the record. <laughs> okay. Once again, Joe Phillips with the Assessor's Office. Uh, I, I just have a couple general questions real quick that I want to ask you. Um, so the, the owner of the property, Well Tower Inc., I have that correct. Is that right? It's Well Tower Inc.? Well, there's different subsidiaries, but the, co but the parent company is Well Tower Inc., yes. Okay. Um, they're known as a real estate investment trust, a REIT. Is that right? Yeah. And they own a large amount of properties throughout U.S., Canada, U.K. Is that right? Yes. And many of those properties are assisted living facilities? Yes. And a large amount of those run on triple net absolute leases? Is that right? No. Actually, a very small amount. A very small amount? Yeah. So, okay. Um, Relative to the rest of their properties, yes. It's becoming less, uh, less beneficial um, when you have a fixed rental payment and fluctuating net income. Um, fixed uh, triple net lease payments that, f that increase on an annual basis are um, not attractive anymore because uh, let's say you have a downturn in the economy, similar to what we're going through now. Um, operators can't pay those rental rates. And so a lot of operators are trying to negotiate out of triple net lease payments um, because they can't just make, they can't make the estimated rental rates, uh, sorry, lease payments to um, the REITs. Um, so luckily uh, on uh, IDEA that passed in 2007, it allows um, REITs and other um, owners to participate in net operating income. And so um, when they have a IDEA structure, the taxable income to Well Tower Inc. is the net operating income. So I, I've reviewed their SEC filings, their 10K filings. <clears throat> uh, they have a long list at the end of the filing that says it lists almost every property that is under a triple net lease. I don't have the number in front of me, but I would estimate well over 200 properties under triple net leases. Is that not a lot of properties? Are you looking at the property type? Because they also own medical office buildings and other types of facilities that yeah, they, are Yeah, they more break it out into to, different yeah, types. So does living, housing? skilled nursing, that sort of thing. Yeah, so we're, we've been operating and working with the properties in California. Um, a majority of the ones we're working on are for Sunrise, uh, for Oakmont, for Belmont, for Belmont Village. Um, so for all the Sunrise properties in California that we've seen, all of the Oakmont properties and all the Belmont Village properties, we haven't seen one with a triple net lease. The subject property doesn't have a triple net lease? No. Then can you explain the lease that was provided to the assessor? That's a inter-party lease agreement that's part of a RIDEA structure. It's done for, um, it's part of the RIDEA requirements to have a taxable REIT subsidiary. And so um, when I discussed that with Well Tower, that payment is actually, um, while the line item says lease, it actually is a transfer of the, it's meant to be a transfer of the net operating income uh, to another subsidiary in the RIDEA structure. Um, but the property has never been rented as a third party triple net lease. It's never been marketed for it. Um, they have no intention of doing it. They're under a RIDEA structure. Um, so that is an intercompany agreement. Um, it's in one pocket, sorry, it's out one pocket and into another. Um, and so the reason why we ignore that under Rule 8 is that Rule 8 specifically disallows um, a lease expense in their definition of gross outgo. It also says that if a property is encumbered by a lease, you're supposed to ignore it. Um, so that is why we ignore that. Um, for the subject property, it's an intercompany agreement, but for properties that have actual third party uh, triple net lease agreements, that's an encumbrance under Rule 8 that's not allowed. So you represent the owner who owns many properties throughout the nation, um, and you've testified you didn't compare the operating income of your subject to any of those other properties that you would have asked access to? Didn't I answer this question earlier? I'm just clarifying. That's what I said, yes. Okay, and the same with operating expenses. You represent the owner that has a large amount of properties. You didn't compare the operating expenses from your subject to any of those properties as well? Yeah, no two properties are identical. Okay. So no, we did not. 
Okay, so uh, board, at this time, the assessor, it's the assessor's position that the applicant has not met the burden of production. Uh, we actually have an exhibit here that discusses why we feel they didn't meet the burden of production, and we would ask the board to hopefully make a decision regarding burden of production at this time. And if it's okay, we'd like to pass out this ex exhibit and kind of explain why. Okay. okay. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I would like to make a comment to that. Um, it seems to me that, that that request or that motion should have been provided prior to us providing our case if that was the assessor's position because now they know our case um, and they're asking us now to, or they're asking the board to deny our case based on production that we've already produced at a, at a prior hearing. Sure, uh, uh, so it is, uh, the procedures of the board is that the board should rule on burden of production after um, the applicant has presented their case in chief. I, I'm trying to look up the property tax rule now. I don't know if county council has baked me to it, but um, that should be done after the board asks their questions to seal up the review of the applicant. So I don't know if you want to first ask questions and then um, hear the burden of production issue and uh, defer to county council further if she has the specific rule on that. Okay. It's property tax rule 313, and which requires that the board, the board shall require the applicant or the applicant's agent to present his or her evidence first, and then the board shall determine whether the applicant has presented proper evidence supporting his or her position. This is what's the burden of production. Okay, understood. Uh, if I may ask, is that prior to cross-examination by the assessor's office? Or is it once we've presented our case in chief? under Rule 313? The rule doesn't specify whether there's cross-examination from the assessor or the board, but it just is after the presentation of evidence. So historically, this has been, we, right. we allow all the questioning to get all the evidence from the applicant, and then if the assessor believes there's a burden of production issue, then the board will rule on it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. I agree. Did you want to do questions first? Yeah, we'll do questions from the board and then we'll allow the assessor to present their paper. Questions from the board to the applicant. I'm going to start with a, a very simple question just so I can understand a little bit better. Um, the owner of the property is Well Tower. And who is Sunrise at Wood Ranch? Is that just the name? Sunrise is the management company that manages the property and Well Tower pays them a management fee. Okay, just a management fee. Yeah, and that's common throughout all Sunrise properties. Sunrise manages the property. Um, the ones we have for Well Tower, Well Tower owns the property and pays Sunrise a management fee. There's no lease agreement between those two parties. Okay, no lease agreement between no. the two. No. Okay. Well so Tower, when, yeah, so Well Tower receives the net operating income less the management fee. Okay, so when the resident pays their, their rent, mm -hmm. they pay it to the management company? Yeah, and then I'm not sure how it gets from Sunrise to Well Tower, but that's Sunrise and our other and our other clients. For example, they manage the books, they create the financials form, they manage the property just like a property manager would. Um, but that net income is Well Towers. Okay, understand. Other questions? Go right ahead. Um, I believe you stated that. Um, in your opinion, the proper approach to valuing this property is the income approach, correct? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, did you consider either um, the sales comparison or the cost approach as an additional test of reasonableness? So under cost approach, it's, you can't really do a test of reasonableness because you can't figure out from the reported sales prices how much was for business value and how much was for real property value. And so that's why we shy away from using like a comparable sales approach. Um, and then for the cost approach, while we do, you know, in certain circumstances, it, it applies, but usually on new construction. Um, with a property that's 11 years in operations, um, no one's going to buy this property on a cost approach. They look at it to get a rate of return on their investment. Cost approach wouldn't help them making that decision at all. Um, and so that's why we stuck with the income approach. Um, and that's, that's what we did. Okay. And then follow up on the uh, sales comparison. Um, what, what would be the main problem with using comparable sales um, to 
value a property like this? So we're not part of those sales transactions. So, um, you know, for instance, we've got another client that um, that buys properties in, San, in sorry in California, and a large portion of it uh, for the senior housing properties is allocated to intangible values. Uh, we're not part of these comparable sales transactions. We don't know what's allocated, and even if we do find something on their books and records, they follow different rules than property tax rule eight. Um, and Revenue and Taxation Code Section 110. Uh, they're following on their books and records um, FASB and uh, GAAP accounting rules. So even if they are listed, um, we would ha still have to do a valuation on those intangible assets and identify it. Those comparable sales won't open up their books to us so we can do that. And if they could, then we would be able to use comparable sales. Um, but everyone's tight-lipped about their sales transactions, even some of our own clients. So it's, okay. yeah. That answers my question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any further questions? No? Council, any questions? Clarifications? Okay, we'll hear from the assessor. So just to confirm, this is regarding just burner production, right? Yes. Correct. Yes. All right, so I'll go Real ahead. Real quick, and so I'll note for the record, this is labeled as Accessors Exhibit G. However, if the board does deny for burden of production and we do not proceed with the assessor's presentation, this would be modified to Exhibit C because there will, otherwise we'll be missing the in-between exhibit. So for now, it's Exhibit G, thank you. Okay. All right, okay, so right I just wanted to kind of describe why the assessor felt the burden of production hasn't been met today by the applicant. Um, we had received some information from them prior to the hearing, but communications did break down to where uh, we really couldn't communicate with the applicant. So we didn't know what they were going to present today. Um, but based on what they presented, uh, this is what we feel. So, uh, so in general, this uh, first one is the government code section. It kind of describes the authority of the Board of Equalization. Uh, it says, and I highlighted there's prescribed rules and regulations to govern local boards of equalization when equalizing and assessors when assessing, including uniform procedures for the consideration and adoption of written findings of fact by local boards of equalization as required by 1611.5 of the Revenue and Taxation Code. So that kind of establishes the authority of the Board of Equalization. Next, section, uh, next page, section 401 of the Revenue and Taxation Code, every assessor shall assess all property subject to general property taxation at its full value. So that gives the assessor's authority there. And then Revenue and Taxation Code, section 110, uh, basically says we have to, we're required to enroll the full cash value for the properties. We don't need to go into too much detail there. Um, I am going to skip over to page seven of this exhibit. So rule 324, you see I highlighted C, it says the board, the applicant, and appraisal witnesses shall be bound by the same principles of valuation that are legally applicable to the assessor. Um, so that's regarding burning protection there. And then Rule 313 has been read already, so I'll go ahead and skip over that. That talks about burden of production. Um, property tax rule 3E is where we talk about the income approach here. So we have the amount that investors would be willing to pay for the right to receive the income that the property would be expected to yield with the risk attendant upon its receipt. Then we jump over to the next page, page 12, which talks about rule eight, the income approach. So I wanted to uh, speak about this highlighted section here, Deri recently derived income and recently negotiated rents of the subject property and comparable properties should be used in estimating the future income in the opinion of the appraiser. Um, Sorry, if in the opinion of the appraiser they are reasonably indicative of the income the property will produce in its highest and best use under prudent management. Income derived from rental of properties is preferred to income derived from their 
operation since income derived from operation is the more likely to be influenced by manager skill and may arise in part from non-taxable personal or non-taxable property or other sources. When income from operating a property is used, sufficient income shall be excluded to provide a return on working capital and other non-taxable operating assets and to compensate unpaid or underpaid management. Uh, so one of the points I wanted to bring up here in this section is you can use the actual operational income and expenses that is allowed, but that section there, E, talks about it still needs to be compared to the market so that you can figure out if, uh, you know, to compensate unpaid or underpaid management. That phrase there is talking about, and we'll see more in this section, in my, um, in my exhibit here, <coughs> excuse me, mm -hmm. my exhibit here, uh, that, um, you know, you have to determine if it's operating prudently under prudent management. We'll get into that more later. And I also uh, highlighted here, income may be capitalized by the use of gross income, gross rent, or gross production multipliers derived by comparing sales prices of closely comparable properties. So this is a big bullet point here. Income may be capitalized by the use of gross income, that's what they did, gross rent, or gross production multipliers derived by comparing sales prices of closely comparable properties. So property tax rule eight says specifically, you, have, you still have to compare to comparable properties with their gross incomes, gross rents, and gross production. Now I'd like to go on to my next highlight here, page 68. This comes from Assessor's Handbook 502 states, when estimating the income to be capitalized, income and expenses are estimated on a market or economic basis. Market income, which is generally income from property rental, is based on market rent, which is the rent that a property would command, assuming prudent management, if placed for rent on the market as of the appraisal date. It is the rental rate prevailing in the market for comparable properties, in contrast to contract rent, which is the actual rental income of a property as specified by the terms of a lease, market expenses reflect the level of operating expenses that a prudent buyer would expect to pay assuming prudent management. If you turn the page, with most income producing properties, potential gross income is primarily in the form of rent, property take or, I'm sorry, Rule 8E recommends using income from property rental rather than business operation, since income derived from operation is more likely to be influenced by managerial skill and may arise in part from non-taxable property or other sources. If operating income must be considered, sufficient income must be excluded to provide a return on working capital and other non-taxable operating assets and to compensate under, unpaid or underpaid management. In the case of owner-occupied properties, rental income can be imputed by reference of two rental data from comparable properties. As discussed, when valuing property for property tax purposes, the relevant rent is market or economic rent. Market rent is the rent a property would command, assuming prudent management, if placed for rent on the market as of the appraisal date. It is the rental rate prevailing in the market for comparable properties. Market rent is typically estimated using recently negotiated rents for the subject property and comparable properties. Um, Madam Chair, if I may, sorry to interrupt. Is the assessor's office presenting their case in chief or rebuttal versus the motion to request um, for documents uh, presented? It's my understanding that this is only regarding the uh, burden of production. That's Sounds all we're like case about. in chief or rebuttal to me, Madam Chair. I'll allow the assessor to proceed. Okay, thank you. Uh, next highlighted section is section 71, or I'm sorry, page 71 at the top. The recent history of the subject and comparable properties is the starting point for estimating vacancy and collection losses. The appraiser should also consider projected market conditions and neighborhood trends. 
Vacancy studies are sometimes published by trade or research groups, often by property type and geographic area. Uh, next highlight, stabilized occupant, occupancy may or may not reflect actual vacancy conditions in the subject property's market submarket or the actual vacancy of the subject property on the valuation date. And then the next highlight, operating expenses are estimated at a market level on the basis of what a prudent owner investor would expect, which may differ significantly from the subject property's current or historical operating expenses. Although the starting point for estimating operating expenses is often the subject property's recent history, this information should be checked against recent data from comparable properties and perhaps pub published data regarding typical expense levels and ratios. Operating expenses can be estimated as a lump sum amount, an amount per square foot, an amount per unit, or as, or as a percentage of effective gross income. And then the rest of these pages I'm not going to touch on. It's just kind of the rest of that section in the assessor's handbook. Um, the next page I want to talk about is page 23, rule 321, which talks about burden of proof. Uh, Section A there, it's the first paragraph. Subject to exceptions by the law, it is presumed that the assessor has properly performed his or her duties. The effect of this presumption is to impose upon the applicant the burden of proving that the value on the assessment roll is not correct or where applicable, applicable. The property in question has not been otherwise correctly assessed. The law requires that the applicant present independent evidence relevant to the full value of the property or other issues presented by the application. And then um, the rest of these just kind of discuss the authority of Board of Equalization, the authority of property tax rules and uh, assessor's handbooks and that sort of thing. Um, so I just include those as a reference. But overall, what we're trying to say here is Yes, you can use operating income. Yes, you can use operating expenses. They still have to be compared to other market participants to determine is the subject property operating at a market income and market expenses. Even though you're using the actual, it, ha it still has to be compared according to the Board of Equalization. That's why we asked our questions that we did. We wanted to make sure, did you compare this to any market comparables that you have in your possession? You know, you represent Well Tower. Well Tower owns a lot of properties. I didn't count it on their 10K reports, but it's a significant amount of properties that they would have access to and easily be able to compare the subject's operating income and expenses against other properties. So for that reason, the assessor believes the burden of proof has not been met because in their presentation, there's pretty much no market evidence to support their value, their value conclusion. And, and can we uh, respond? Yes. Do you have something I'll you want to ask? Go instead? right ahead. OK. Uh, number one, the uh, first thing you mentioned was that communication broke down. So back in December of, I believe, 2021, uh, we had a hearing on an information request that the assessor's office had. And they were asking for information from properties across the entire country um, for triple net lease expense, uh, sorry, triple net lease agreements. Um, and we argued in front of the board uh, that there were no triple net lease agreements for the subject property. That doesn't happen. Um, the board ruled that um, um, while the assessor's office asked for that information from across the country, um, we needed to provide the uh, inter-party lease agreement for the subject property. So we did that. Um, and along with that, we provided hundreds of line items of the income statement from 2017 to 2019. Um, it sounds like their one focus is uh, on the one line item for a inter-party lease agreement. Um, we had this hearing uh, back in December of 21, and uh, the board ruled that uh, that information on other properties wasn't relevant to the subject property. Uh, that was already determined in the written findings for that case. Um, so we followed the, the board's instructions to provide it for the subject property, and they said, we'll weigh whether it's relevant or not um, when the valuation hearing comes time, uh, considering it's an intercompany lease agreement. Um, so we did that. Um, 
And so it sounds like, and then the reason we said that in that hearing is that, uh, you know, as we said in our case in chief, um, Rule 8 says that you're supposed to ignore any lease encumbrances. Um, and so that's why we didn't use a triple lease for the subject property and compare it to the market um, because that property doesn't, or sorry, that transaction doesn't happen and it's against Rule 8. Um, so a lot of the requests for information that we didn't provide them were based on this issue um, that we argued is against Rule 8. Um, also sounds like their motion is mostly a complaint that we didn't do enough market comparisons. Um, that's not a lack of production. They just don't like the income number we came up with. Um, and you know, I, I imagine that they're gonna come up with a different income stream. Um, we haven't seen their case yet, uh, but if they have a different income stream, they'd like the value of the property, and we use the actuals, and we provide them with hundreds of line items about the actuals. Um, the property's been operating for 11 years. Um, they mentioned in, in the assessor's handbook, and we agree, that market rates and market rental rates could be drastically different from operating properties. Um, the way we've seen that applied is when you're dealing with a new property that's in lease up, not for 11 year operating properties that have been stabilized at 91%. Um, we, when we see that applied, we see it with new construction, let's say, um, and I would approach on a new, newly constructed property and there's no one there. Obviously the property is not worth nothing and so most assessor's offices and taxpayers will estimate what the rental rates are going to be and, and they come up with an analysis based on that. And in that situation, the rental rates are drastically different than actuals because there aren't any residents in the property. Um, and so uh, I believe you have another item. <clears throat> yes, I'd like to make a couple comments prior to the board ruling. <clears throat> Go ahead. Um, First of all, let me just summarize what I think the, the issues are here. We are using actuals that we think is what the market participants do, and we've represented Well Tower and a number of other retirement communities, and that's how they've performed. Um, that's how they've gotten loans, and that's how they've attracted investors, is based on their actuals. Um, and they've got a longstanding history with a number of other properties. It's clear that the assessor's office is trying to use a what if self-serving triple net lease to value the subject property? And that triple net lease that the assessor's office is using, um, if we're allowed to see what they present today, will show that the lease payment is gonna be greater than the actual operating income, um, which then begs the question of, how can a lessee or a lessor relationship be where the actual operating income doesn't cover the lease payment? Someone's gonna go out of pocket for additional monies. Um, so the assessor's office really wants to try to preserve this triple net lease calculation. And in that defense, which we, we hesitated in mentioning, um, we have filed a lawsuit in Los Angeles County in Superior Court on this exact issue because we think it violates Rule 8. Um, and that court case is pending in Los Angeles County on this approach. Um, because we don't believe that it's what market participants do. We know that this property um, did not sell or would not sell as a triple net lease uh, when one is not present. So you have to ask yourself as an investor or even a lender, how would you value this property? On a triple net lease that doesn't exist um, or on the actuals? Okay. So noted. All right, uh, fellow board members, would you like to meet with council in closed session briefly to discuss this? Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, we will uh, be in closed session for 20 minutes. Uh, we'll say 20 minutes for now. If it's gonna take longer, I'll let you know. Okay. We're off the record.
Ready. We're back on the record. All parties have returned. All right. Just a, before we proceed, a procedural question for the clerk. Um, do we have findings of fact on this case? Uh, the applicant's representative has requested written findings of fact, and we are, uh, they have indicated payment will be to me by the end of the business day. Okay. So the applicant. Very good. All right. Um, the board has met in closed session to discuss the motion presented by the assessor regarding the burden of production. And after discussion, we have uh, decided to vote, and it's a 3-0 vote in favor of the applicant that they have met their burden of production. So at this point, we'd like to hear the assessor's case. Thank you, board members, for uh, spending the time to do that. We appreciate that. Um, so uh, just some, I guess, clarification. Uh, our first point of questioning was mainly directed at burden of production. Um, there are some additional questions that, if the burden of production had gone the other way, would be irrelevant. Um, I was wondering, is it okay if the assessor asks those questions, or would you rather us just present our, our case? Um, I, is that right with you to proceed with questions? Yeah, yeah I think uh, to continue the continuity of the discussion, I think questions should go first. Okay. So right. additional questions on the applicant's presentation. Okay. Is that allowable, clerk? I think so, Chair Little. I just wanted to make sure uh, we, we have a kind of understanding of the rest of the day presentation-wise as well. I believe uh, Mr. Tobias indicated they will have a rebuttal evidence presentation. Is that correct? Um, so normally your board would hear anything from the applicant all up front, but you, the parties can request to do their rebuttal after the opposing party's presentation. So it sounds like, I guess, want to confirm, you want to present your bird rebuttal after the assessor presents their case in chief, correct? Yes, that'll give That's more correct. context into what we're talking about. Okay, so we will hear, so in, in that case, the, how the day would go, I think I understand, and I'll recap it for the parties. We'll finish, uh, if there's any additional questions from the assessor, the assessor will present their case in chief. Uh, the applicant will have the opportunity to ask the assessor questions, then the board will have the opportunity to ask the assessor questions, then the applicant will present their rebuttal case, and then the questioning will follow for that. Um, if the assessor is also requesting a rebuttal, um, we would do that, although we'd assume that is part of the assessor's presentation. Uh, and then closing arguments would follow with the assessor making the first set of closing arguments, and then as the applicant has the burden of proof, the law uh, indicates their closing arguments would go last, so we would end the day with the applicant's closing arguments. I just want to make sure right. uh, all parties are on the same page. Right, exactly. Okay, go right ahead with questions on the applicant's presentation. All right, thank you. Um, uh, so my first question here, I, I just wanted to ask, it, is either of you a licensed appraiser? No. Can you describe the um, qualifications you have that allows you to represent taxpayers for appeals? I'm going first. Yes. Um, we both have a master's degree in taxation with financial and mathematical backgrounds. Uh, we've represented taxpayers for over 30 years. I'm the former director of tax and valuation for a major public utility company, San Diego Gas and Electric. Um, and so we have clients. Um, in state and local tax arena, multiple states. I've also worked with a uh, senior housing operator and owner uh, for a number of years in the past. Um, I've worked for uh, Robin Ellis and Cassie Turley in their senior housing financial analysis uh, group. Um, and as you said, I got uh, undergrad in finance and, econo and minor in economics, uh, master's in tax. Um, also probably dealt with a few hundred of these acquisition projects for senior housing over the last nine to ten years and uh, have fielded questions from uh, both operators and owners about uh, um, valuation and uh, acquisition and sales transactions um, as well as helped with their pro formas. Um, they do a lot of work in their pro formas on estimating property taxes because they're trying to determine what the net operating is going to be 
not net operating income is going to be. Sorry. Um, so that's that's our experience on that. Thank you. Um, my next question, I'm going to reference uh, the page, or it's Exhibit 17, and at the bottom it says one of eight. It's the um, your profit and loss statement for 2019. Yes. Uh, is there any edits or omissions in this profit and loss statement? Um, we do not include anything after net operating income. Uh, there's entity uh, expenses and deductions after that that aren't uh, allowed under Rule 8. Um, it's standard across most of California that none of the counties we deal with go past net operating income. Um, it includes items like interest expense that's not allowed, uh, depreciation not allowed, um, gain or loss on uh, capital um, sales not allowed. Um, Lease expenses uh, not allowed under Rule 8. Um, so those are the only items that come after net operating income uh, that we don't include in these analysis. Okay, so just to sum up, this is a not a full profit and loss statement. No, but we did provide a full copy to the assessor's office multiple times. It's a three or four hundred uh, line items. Thank you. Okay, uh, on to page it says five of eight of that same exhibit. Oh, sorry, not that page. My apologies. Next page, six of eight. <clears throat> so you're determining here a return on working capital. Um, and I'm an appraiser. I typically think in equations and that sort of thing. So it looks like the equation you have here is you have the total operating expenses and then three months working capital reserves and then you apply a 3% rate to that. So this formula that you have here, is that based on any uh, like guidance or um, appraisal teachings from any, like the Board of Equalization or any outside appraisal teachings for determining this calculation? Yeah, you can find that in one of the assessor's handbook. They do a similar calculation, and it's also under the guidance of Rule 8 that says you have to deduct a return on working capital. Right, but the, the method you've done it, the steps you've taken here to do it, three months working capital, starting with operating expenses, rate of return 3%, is that spelled out anywhere? Yes, in one of the assessor's handbook. Can you point that to me or no? I, as I said before, it's, I believe they do an example on the, there's one for mining that they use. Um, it's a similar calculation, obviously different industries, but one plus one equals two in any industry, so it's the same calculation. Okay, because I looked and I didn't see a formula like this one. Um, and I think you explained <clears throat> rate of return 3%. Where was that coming from again? It was... It's like a standard. It's like a standard money market fund return, um, but on, but on your last comment, you didn't see any any uh, formula. Um, you know, under Section One Ten that says that you have to deduct intangibles, it doesn't provide a formula. It doesn't mean you don't have to follow it. So you have to come up with some reasonable approach, and so that's what we've done here. Okay. Is there any market evidence or market support that shows this is a acceptable way of calculating or an acceptable rate of return? for return on working capital? Yeah, we've spoken to operators across many industries and they tend to have cash on hand to cover expenses for a certain number of months. It's usually more than three months. Um, as I said before, COVID showed that that dries up real quick um, if something happens. Um, so yes, companies that have operations like this do have cash on hand and under Rule 8, you have to calculate a return on that cash on hand and that's what we've done. Okay. Mr. Phillips, if I may. Yeah. Sessor's Handbook 560, Mining Operations. It's amazing what modern science does with a cell phone. <laughs> uh, but if you look at Sessor's Handbook 560, you'll see an example provided on the calculation of working capital allowances. And it's on point with, uh, with our derived methodology. I believe also that a Sessor's Handbook 560 will address capital reserves. I'm sorry, are you saying, oh, 560? 560. So that's the assessment of mining properties? Yeah. Correct. 
And sorry, did you have a page number? Uh, if you give me a few minutes with your questions, I can continue to look it up okay. on my cell phone, but uh, it is present. Do you have another question? We'll allow him time. He's researching <laughs> on his computer okay. there. So I, I believe I found what you're talking about. It, the equation says working, the equation itself is working capital equals total annual operating costs times number of months in the pipeline divided number of months in a year. So you feel that equation relates to assisted living facilities? That's a Y formula in that, in that assessor's handbook. Now, Y formula, um, if you remember your mathematic uh, in your undergraduate degree in business, it goes over a Y factor, a Y and X factor. And that methodology um, uh, uh, is an application that we believe can be applied. You don't find it in any other assessor's handbook. Um, but all the assessor's handbooks address working capital in general. It's kind of like a paired sales analysis or a linear or multiple regression analysis. The assessor's handbook and, and 502 addresses those methodologies, regression, but it doesn't tell you how to do it. Um, that's probably the closest you're gonna find. Um, uh, I think in cap A and cap B, that is taught by the Appraisal Institute. They also address that, um, but they don't give a solid formula for it. But you know very well from COVID, taxpayers were short of funds to pay their insurance premiums, to pay their payroll if they wanted to keep their employees, to pay um, uh, operating expenses. You have one of two methods if you're a business owner. You can either take out a line of credit which isn't free, you have to pay a fee on the line of credit if you're operating, or you calculate a return on um, an allowance for working capital. It's one of the two. You're gonna incur one or the other. Um, you mentioned COVID a couple times. Uh, we're valuing the property as of January 1st, 2020. Did anyone, any market participants know about COVID at that time? It is within the 90 days that's used under sales comps that allows uh, comparable sales within 90 days. I believe COVID happened in like the 80th day. So in a sales comparable approach, which we didn't use, it would have applied to property sales that happened after uh, the lockdown happened. So if the property hypothetically had sold on January 1st, 2020, no market participants would have known about COVID at that time? No, the, under the 90-day rule, it assumes that it gives you 90 days because they assume that transactions don't occur immediately as of the date that it's negotiated. There's a, there's, if you ever see releases on pending transactions, they don't release the pending transaction news the same day that it doesn't close the same day. There is, that's why the 90 day rule exists is that some transactions that occur on January 1st, they might have 90 days to go back and negotiate. Um, that happens commonly. That's why, um, that's why the 90 day rule exists for sales comps. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the next page, page seven of eight on that same exhibit, you have work, a work return on workforce in place. Uh, so my questions here are going to be pretty similar. It looks like you have an equation. You, gra you took the actual labor expenses from the P&L, and then you applied the capitalization rate to that to get a return on workforce in place. So my question is, the, the, the capitalization rate is a set formula. It's the... NOI of the subject property, the net operating income divided by a sales price gives you a capitalization, capitalization rate. Now you can use that capitalization rate for another property's NOI to determine a value or another property's sales price to determine a net operating income. 
But sorry, Mr. Phillips, do you have a question? Yes, I'm explaining my question. Okay. So the the capitalization rate has a set formula, and there's basically three items in that formula that the cap rate can apply to. How does the cap rate apply to re return on workforce in place, considering the formula is NOI divided by a sales price? So you have to look at the relationship between NOI and sales price. NOI is a form of cash flow, which is equivalent to a rate of ret to a cash return. So capitalization rates are similar to rates of return. Actually, if we had used a discount rate, um, discount rates are a little bit higher. So we went conservative and used the cap rate, which is lower. Um, if we would have used a true discount rate and tried to calculate uh, the weighted average cost of capital on debt and equity, we would have arrived at a value higher than that, um, probably closer to 9 or 10%, maybe higher, depending on their uh, appetite for risk on the property. And so um, the alternative way to do it would yield a larger deduction. So we thought this was a conservative alternative. I'd like to make a comment on that as well. <clears throat> If you've ever represented a buyer or a seller in a market transaction, and if the employees were all removed, the question becomes, how long would it take you to identify, interview, hire, and retain? So I represented San Diego Gas and Electric in its sale of the Encina power plant, and the Public Utility Commission required all employees, operating and maintenance employees, to stay there for one full year. All the employees at this retirement community are special trained. The Department of Health Services requires them to have CPR training, all of them. They require them to have certain uh, training experience in dealing with dementia. So the question is, could you replace all of those employees operating and management within a three month period? I highly doubt it. And if it's a three month period, that actual cost would be $940,000. I don't know any business other than maybe a, 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 a bagel shop or a clerical position that could be trained and replaced in less than three months. So if you look at, and, and we've gone through this with so many different counties, um, uh, and, and most of the counties look at this analysis differently. Some of them look at it consistently. Um, some of them think that it should be six months. We've had one county offer us six months, another one one month. You're not going to replace these employees in one month. It's not going to happen. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure how that relates to my question. I don't see any months on this page, page seven of eight. You're saying the alternative calculation would be months to replace, and that's a much higher number. And as I said on the rate of return, there's alternative methods that would garner larger deductions. We're trying to be conservative here and uh, not ask for the entire boat, but we're also trying to be reasonable. Uh, so this is one of the methods to calculate a value for the workforce in place, and it's the assumption that the property is not, sorry, the operators, uh, the owners, are not going to just ask for their money back. They're going to ask for their money back plus a rate of return. Otherwise, why would they spend $3 million seven on workforces, sorry, on labor, if all they were going to do was get their money back? If they weren't going to get any return on it, they wouldn't make that expense. I, I think you misunderstand my question. I'm not asking, you know, if a return on workforce should be calculated. I'm asking about the calculation itself. You know, it's very clear the capitalization rate is determined using NOI divided by sales price. You've then taken it out of that box of NOI or sales price and applied a cap rate to labor expenses that yeah, you're talking... Apples to rocks, no. they're not even yeah. related. No, net operating income is equivalent to a return, or sorry, uh, cash flow, if you will. Cash flow over the price you pay, that is the calculation for a rate of return. Um, it's, it's used in different terminology, uh, different uh, industries, but uh, when you take a cash flow over the price you paid for it, that is a rate of return, no matter what industry you apply it to. Yes, but you're... 
you're applying a rate of return to labor expenses? How does that make sense? Yeah, on Rule 8, it says you have to apply a, a, a rate of return on non-taxable intangible assets. Workforce in place, intangible. Rate of return, 7.1%. Uh, cash flow over price. That's how we get to return on workforce in place. I, I hate to answer a question with a question. How does Ventura County calculate the value of a trained and experienced workforce? If, if you can't answer that now, we'll ask it in rebuttal, or we'll ask it in cross. But the question then is, you're asking for our formula and our methodology, which we've spent time with taxpayers on and other counties. Please, tell us how you calculate an employee value over and above the expense to give a rate of return. So I'm just trying to understand your presentation here. So well, then we'll ask it on our cross. Okay, I'm going to step in here and um, go to the applicant. I believe the assessor is only asking, um, and I think you've already answered it, is how you feel the cap rate is a proper multiplier in your equation. Am I correct to the assessor? That is correct, yes. Yeah, we're using it as a, as a rate of return equivalent because it's a cash flow over uh, capital, sorry, Cap rate is determined by taking a cash flow over the price you paid for that asset. That is equivalent to a rate of return. And so it's a conservative number in our view if you know, discount rates are usually a bit higher than cap rates. Um, and so we didn't go that route. We it could have been a higher number, but again, we're trying to use a conservative number and just um, we thought it would be, uh, frankly, less argument to instead of going over the calculation for weighted average cost of capital on debt and equity, uh, that might go in one ear and out the other. Um, that's you know, pretty high investment level uh, in finance. Um, so that's why we try to, um, you know, the saying, keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> uh, cap rate is, you know, is a conservative number instead of going over the mathematics on uh, weighted average cost of capital. OK. OK. Um, <clears throat> I, unless. Either of you have questions? I think that's, um, that's our conclusion for questions. OK. All right, I'm looking at the clock. It's 20 minutes till 12. And I'm concerned about starting the assessor's presentation and just going you know, 20 minutes into it. Would you prefer to start your presentation after lunch? Um, I'm OK either way. Uh, I think I would estimate around 20 minutes for a presentation. I imagine the questions will take quite a bit longer. OK, um, well, why it, don't we do your presentation? And then over lunch, then the applicant can come up with their questions about your presentation. We'll do that after lunch. Yeah, we're OK that with that. all right with you, Brendan? OK, let's go ahead. I'm sorry I missed that. They're doing their presentation now and then lunch, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. They expected about 20 sorry, minutes. There's quite a Each stack is one. Is okay, basically. Oh, I get it. Okay. You get it? It's like, yeah. Oops. Okay. Well, let me give you this one. Okay. Thank you, Brendan. <laughs> I'll get them organized. That's okay. Drop them. I didn't have large enough paper clips to keep them together. All right, there's the last two for you. Assessors exhibit C, D, E, and F have been submitted to the record, and then previously exhibit G was submitted. Thank you. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, there's a lot of paperwork here. Don't worry, we're not going through all of it. Um, so starting with exhibit C, uh, I'm just going to start on page two. So, pursuant to Revenue and Taxation Section 51A, 
the assessor is required to enroll the lesser of the factor base year value or its full cash value as of the lien date. Revenue Taxation Code 461D. Um, the assessor shall prepare an assessment roll containing the base value, appropriately indexed, or the current lien date full value, whichever is less. Increases and decreases in full cash value since the previous lien date shall be reflected on the roll, except that taxable value shall never exceed base year value appropriately indexed. That's um, basic stuff we all know, right? Um, I went over the summary of the subject, so I'll go to valuation history at the bottom. So the California State Board of Equalization notified the assessor that the subject property had a change in control effective July 1st, 2013. The fair market value was determined to be 20 million and that established the base value for the property pursu pursuant to revenue and taxation code section 75.10. An appeal was filed for the January 1st, 2013 change in control on the basis that the enrolled values were incorrect, uh, but that appeal was eventually withdrawn. The subject remained on its factored base year value for 2014 through 2018. Prop 8 appeals were filed for the 2014 through 2017 lien dates, but these appeals were eventually withdrawn. For the 2019 lien date, an appeal was filed and a stipulation was reached. The subject was given a Prop 8 reduction to 20 million for 2019. As a follow-up to the 2019 appeal, the subject was reviewed for 2020 lien date and a reduction was warranted. 21 million was enrolled as the market value for 2020. So that's just a brief history of how we got to 2020. Um, the appraisal that was used for the 2019 stipulation and the 2020 Prop 8 reduction was a method of direct capitalization where the income from the business operation is used to derive an indicator of value. value. Using business operation requires an estimate of the intangible assets going concern value or business value. And the intangible assets must be removed from the estimate of value since it is not part of the real property. According to property tax rule eight and assessor's handbook 502 advanced appraisal, using business operation is not the preferred method of valuation. So property tax rule eight E states recently derived income and recently negotiated rents or royalties of the subject property and comparable properties should be used in estimating the future income. If the opinion of the appraiser, they are reasonably indica indicative of the income the property will produce in its highest and best use under prudent management. Income derived from the rental of properties is preferred to income derived from their operation since in income derived from operation is the more likely to be influenced by managerial skill and may arise in part from non-taxable property or other sources. When income from operating a property is used, sufficient income shall be excluded to provide a return on working capital and other non-taxable operating assets and to compensate unpaid or underpaid management. And then Assessor's Handbook Section 502 Advanced Appraisal states, with most income producing properties, the potential gross income is primarily in the form of rent. Par Rule AE recommends using income from property rental rather than business operation. Since income derived from operation is more likely to be influenced by managerial skill and may arise in part from non-taxable property or other sources. If operating income must be considered, sufficient income must be excluded to provide a return on working capital and other non-taxable operating assets and to compensate unpaid or underpaid management. In the case of owner-occupied properties, rental income can often be imputed by reference to rental data from comparable properties. Calculating a value for the intangible assets is challenging because determining the value is subjective and arbitrary and difficult to prove using market comparable data since that type of data does not typically exist. There is also no prescribed method for determining intangible asset value from the BOE. Basically, the Board of Equalization doesn't really give us nice easy formulas to calculate these intangible items. Um, 
for this next section, I just kind of, I'm not going to read from it. I want to describe it. So for assisted living facilities, the assessor's office has not had access to typical means of information. Uh, usually we go, we look towards CoStar, which is a, uh, a um, subscription service that has market data for the assessor to use and determine market value with. Uh, assisted living facilities don't have this information. Um, so due to the lack of information the assessor's office had for a number of years, we would use operational income and expenses. Um, whoever the assigned appraiser was would get this information and compare and determine what's a market income, market expenses, that sort of thing. Um, so at beginning in, you know, shortly after the stipulation was reached for 2019 and a value enrolled for 2020, the assessor's office started getting a lot more appeals with assisted living facilities. Um, so we started taking a look at it and saying, are we valuing these appropriately? Is there um, other sources we can get information? So our office actually, outside the appeals crew, did a, um, a, like a special research project to try to find out what other information we could get regarding assisted living facilities. Um, so that's what I want to talk about next. Um, and I might, <laughs> I might uh, repeat myself a little bit, but I'm going to read from this now again. Mm, okay. All right, I think I summed that up. Okay, so one thing I wanted to point out is, like the applicant said, um, comparable sales for assisted living facilities can be unreliable because often the business is included in the sale of the assisted living facility. And so it is challenging to determine what is the going concern or what is that business value that's included in that sales price and how should it be deducted, deducted from the sales prices. So comparable sales, like the applicant said, are a bit more unreliable for assisted living facilities in general. Um, <clears throat> all right, so I'm gonna be starting kind of midway through that large paragraph on page four. So the results of our research showed that the majority of assisted living facilities are owned by REITs, um, real estate investment trusts, like the subject property. These REITs are publicly traded companies that report to the U.S. Security and Exchange Commission, commonly referred to the SEC. The assessor reviewed the company filings. These are called 10K reports uh, for a number of these REITs and found that a large number of the assisted living facilities that are owned by the REITs are under triple net leases. And I believe the applicant actually mentioned I believe before, I think he said 2007, I think that's right, I don't have it in front of me. They used to all be under triple net leases. Actually, it was required by law that they all be triple net leases. In 2007, they changed it because um, they allowed the, these REITs to um, start operating under management agreements, which allowed them to partake in more of the revenues of the assisted living facilities. Because what was happening is Triple net leases, they have normal ex rent escalations. So the amount of income or escalations they could receive was limited under these triple net leases. So the, the federal uh, government allowed them to start entering into management agreements, which allowed them to share in more of the revenues that they were having in these facilities. Um, so that's why that was allowed in 2007. And then since 2007, there's been most of these REITs have been kind of transferring from triple net leases to uh, hiring managers to manage the property and they get to partake in the proceeds. Um, but there is still, if you look at these REITs and their 10K reports, there's a significant number of these properties, assisted living facilities that are still under triple net leases, okay? Um, so the assessor reviewed the company filings of 10K reports for a number of these REITs and found that a large number of the assisted living facilities that are owned by the REITs are under triple net leases. 
Based on the assessor's research of these company filings, the assessor was able to get market indicators of what a market triple net lease is for assisted living facilities. The assessor now values all assisted living facilities using the preferred method described in Property Tax Rule 8 and the method taught by the Board of Equalization. So like we said earlier, using the operating expenses, operating income, that's not wrong, right? We can do that. It's just not the preferred method. Now we have the data that we needed in order to support using the preferred method for assisting living facilities. So that's why since when that stipulation was reached in 2019 and the value was enrolled in 2020, since then our office has switched to using triple net leases from this market data uh, for assisted living facilities. All right, the next section I wanna talk about is senior housing industry outlook. Um, this is just kind of a general overview of senior housing. Uh, so based on market indicators, the demand for senior housing has been increasing and will continue to increase. The US Bureau of the Census estimates that between 1990 and 2050, the number of Americans aged 65 and older will more than double from 31 million to 1990 to more than 79 million in 2050. The National Investment Center for Senior Housing and Care, known as NIC, recently published a research paper in 2019 on the future need for senior housing. The results of this research show that significantly more housing will be needed in the future in order to meet the rising demand. Regarding new construction, NIC also estimated that approximately 881,000 units will, need, will be needed from 2019 to 2030. In Ventura County, there has been approximately nine new assisted living facilities that have begun construction from 2017 to present. So all this just shows there's a rising demand, rising new construction of assisted living facilities, and all of this indicates that this is a favorable market for assisted living facilities. So we're just seeing a general upward trend for assisted living facilities over the years, mainly because of demand. So next is a review of the subject's master lease. So as part of the applicant's 441D response, the assessor was given a copy of the subject's original master lease. The master lease was dated March 14th, 2014, uh, and section A of the recital states the following. As of July 1st, 2013, landlord entered into a master lease agreement. Um, landlord and tenant now desire to amend and restate the original lease to add a new property located in Atlanta, Georgia, and to add Buckhead's GA Senior Living Owner LLC as the landlord. Um, so I reviewed this master lease that was provided by the applicant. Uh, the master lease named the landlord for the subject property as Simi Valley CA Senior Living Owner, LLC. The tenant, HCRI SL2 TRS Corp, subtenant, HCRI Sun2 Simi Valley CA Senior Living LP. Uh, the manager is Sunrise Senior Living Management. The lease commenced on July 1st, 2013, expires on June 30th, 2028. The tenant has the option to renew the lease for one 10-year renewal term and one four-year 11-month renewal term. Therefore, the entire term of the lease is one day shy of 30 years. These are just kind of the facts from the lease. Uh, section 2.2.1 said, commencing on the first rent adjustment date, and on each rent adjustment date thereafter, the annual base rent shall be revised to reflect the then current fair market rental value as reasonably determined in good faith by landlord and tenant. As of each rent adjustment date, landlord shall calculate the base rent as so adjusted and shall deliver the revised rent schedule to tenant no later than 30 days after the rent adjustment date. Rent adjustment date means for the initial term July 1st, 2016, and each third anniversary of such date thereafter. And for each renewal term, the first day of such renewal term and each third anniversary of such date thereafter. So to sum that up, what the lease tells us is that every three years, the rent will be adjusted to a agreed upon current fair market rental value between the tenant and the landlord. That's what the lease says. 
Section 2.5 says, this lease shall be deemed and construed to be an absolute net lease and tenant shall pay all rent and other charges and expenses in connection with the leased property throughout the term without abatement, deduction, recoupment, or set off. So that statement tells us this is an absolute triple net lease. 15.3.1, tenant and each subtenant shall periodically during the term of the lease deliver to landlord the annual financial statements, periodic financial statements, annual facility budget, annual budget, and all other documents, reports, schedules, and copies described in Exhibit E. Uh, I just included that to show they're very detail-oriented and how they um, keep track of their properties, all these properties they have all of these different financial statements just to, so they're, they're very diligent and how they keep track of their properties and their money and everything like that. Um, the next one, review of subject management agreement. So as part of the applicant's 441D response, the assessor was given a copy of the subject's original management agreement. Uh, the management agreement is dated July 1st, 2013, same as the master lease. It lists the owner as Simi Valley CA Senior Living Owner LLC and the master tenant. So all, the, all those are the same as the master lease, all those um, actors. Um, and the manager is senior, Sunrise Senior Living Management Incorporated. Section 3.1 says, as compensation for the services to be rendered by management pursuant to this agreement, manager shall receive on a monthly basis in errors a management fee during the term equal to five and one half percent. Um, 4.03, the management duties prepare and deliver to tenant the proposed budget, the reports, the financial statements required in article six and such other information as required by this agreement. So all that to say, based on this documentation, we learned the structure of the subject property was you have a manager, the manager pays a, gets paid a management fee for their services. Then the rest of the income goes to a subtenant. Subtenant then pays the tenant, and then the tenant pays the landlord or the owner. So that's kind of the structure that we have based on these documentation. So then I wanted to discuss briefly the subject's 10K report from their SEC filings. So I pulled out some quotes here that I thought were relevant. Our triple net properties offer services included independent living and independent supportive living, assisted living, continuing care retirement communities, Alzheimer's dementia care and care homes with or without nursing. Described above, as well as long-term post-acute care, we invest primarily through acquisitions, development, and joint venture partnerships. Our properties are primarily, primarily leased to operators under long-term triple net master leases that obligate the tenant to pay all operating costs, utilities, real estate taxes, insurance, building repairs, maintenance costs, and all obligations under certain ground leases. We are not involved in property management. So that statement on their 10K just shows, like I said, absolute triple net leases. Uh, the next paragraph talks about, it, it just pointed out two of their major uh, tenants that are under triple net leases. It talks about um, the first one, ProMedica Health, that's one of their tenants. Uh, it describes you know, how much of the revenues is from them. It also goes on to describe, in addition to rent, the master lease requires ProMedica to pay all operating costs, utilities, real estate, taxes, insurance, building repairs, maintenance costs, and all obligations under certain ground leases. So there again, it's kind of pointing out two of its major tenants that they basically pay everything under a triple net lease. So turning to page eight, I wanted to go on to the next one. Our properties are prim primarily comprised of land buildings, improvements, and related rights. Our triple net properties are generally leased to operators and are long-term operating leases. The leases generally have a fixed contractual term of 12 to 15 years and contain one or more five to 15 year renewal options. Most of her rents are received under triple net leases, requiring the operator to pay rent and all additional charges incurred in the operation of the lease property. The tenants are required to repair, rebuild, and maintain the lease properties. Substantially, all these operating leases are designed with escalating rent structures. 
Leases with fixed annual rent escalators are generally recognized on a straight line basis over the initial lease period subject to a collectability assessment. Rental income related to leases with contingent rental escalators is generally recorded based on the contractual rent cash rental payments due for the period. Next paragraph. At December 31st, 2019, approximately 95% of our triple net properties were subject to master leases. A master lease is a lease for multiple properties to one tenant entity under a single lease or agreement. From time to time, we may acquire additional properties that are then leased to the tenant under the master lease. The tenant is required to make one monthly payment that represents rent on all the properties that are subject to the master lease. So moving on. So the subject's 10K report shows triple net average annualized revenues of 14,578 per bed unit for 2019, which is a monthly 1,214 per bed unit. For 2018, the triple net average annualized revenue was 12,831 per bed unit or 1,069 per bed unit monthly. Um, that was basically just a graph in their financial statements that pointed that out. Or not a graph, a table, sorry. Uh, the subject's 10K report also shows that during 2019, 10 triple net properties were purchased for an investment amount of 217 million and a combined cap rate of 6.5%. These properties were located in New Jersey, Illinois, and the United Kingdom. So I just wanted to point that out to show there are sales happening with the subject property or not the subject property, but the owner. The owner is involved in purchasing and selling their properties. Um, so moving on, on December 6, 2021, the assessor made their 441D information request known to the Assessment Appeals Board. Since that time, the assessor has received a copy of the master lease dated March 14, 2014, and copies of presum presumably unedited income and expense statements. The income and expense statement show the amount of rent paid to the owner. For 2017, the rent paid was 1,008 per bed unit. 2018, we had 1,240 per bed unit. And for 2019, we had 1,209 per bed unit based on these income and expense statements we received. The applicant has informed the assessor that a merger occurred on December 15, 2017. The owner mentioned in the master lease and the management agreement merged into Well Tower Prop Co. Group LLC. The master tenant and tenant mentioned in the master lease and management agreement merged into Well Tower Op Co. Group LLC. The manager remained the same, according to the information we have. Uh, no documentation was provided to the assessor regarding the merger. No updated or amended lease or management agreement was provided to show how the merger impacted the subject property. No rent schedule was provided as described in the master lease. As of January 1st, 2020, it is unclear to the assessor how the lease is administered and what impacts the merger had on the lease. Uh, according to Sims v. Pope, which was a 1990 case, where the taxpayer has been accorded the first opportunity to produce the required data and refer refuses to do so, the assessor is not thereby relieved of his, this obligation to act. He is still required by law to assess the value of the ta all taxable property, but he is then authorized to utilize whatever evidence is available to him. Uh, so therefore, based on that Sims v. Pope court case, regardless of the information not supplied to the assessor, it is still the assessor's duty to use the information that is available to the assessor to determine a market triple net lease for the subject property as prescribed by the Board of Equalization. The assessor determined that the 1,209 uh, per bed unit that was listed in the 20, subject's 2019 income statement is considered a market rent for the subject when compared to comparable market data. This market rent was then used in the direct capitalization method to arrive at an indicator of value for January 1st, 2020. 
The assessor also utilized the comparable sales approach, but due to the weakness of the available comparable sales, more emphasis, emphasis was given to the income approach. Also, the available comparable sales may include in going concern value, which makes the real property value less certain, which we've talked about. Uh, next, I would like to just kind of go through the rest of this. We have on page 11, we have some pictures of the subject property. These were taken from their website. And then we're gonna skip to page 17. 17 is our income, income approach. Um, basically, we took our market rent that we estimated, 1,209. We multiply that by the number of beds, 97 beds, to get an estimate of income there. We applied a vacancy collection loss factor of 5%. Um, we felt 5% was a reasonable amount, but uh, for assisted living facilities, for a, a, an assisted living facility to be vacant is extremely rare in the marketplace. So we thought 5% was very conservative, although we feel that using less is definitely warranted just because you don't see assisted living facilities go vacant. There's too much demand for them to go vacant. Um, then we applied management fee expenses and reserves that total about 5%. It's kind of an industry standard for triple net leases. We applied a capitalization rate, 6%. We agreed with the applicant's capitalization rate of 6%. Where we disagree, uh, since this is a triple net lease, the owner is not expected to pay property taxes. Therefore, we don't add a property tax allowance to our cap rate because the owner does not have, does not pay the property taxes. So that's the reason there. So for triple net leases, we don't load the cap rate with a property tax allowance. Any other lease where the owner does pay property taxes, we would load in that um, property tax allowance to our cap rate. So we do agree with the applicant with the 6% cap rate. Based on those numbers, we come to just above 21 million, 21 million 100,000. Um, and we'll go into a bit more details on the following pages. So on page 18, we start the market rent research here. So page 19, I wanted to describe 19 and the following pages here. These next few pages are the results of our, our office's special research project. These aren't specific to our subject property, although we can extract some market data from them. Uh, so the, these are kind of general points from um, the special research project that we did. Um, so I'm not gonna read all of it. I wanna touch on a few things here. Um, so if you go to where it says capital senior living from 10K report, it describes quite a bit of stuff. It describes, you know, how many properties are leased, um, gives quite a bit of numbers, describes that they're triple net leases, that sort of thing. Um, then it lists a few of the owners that they are renting from. They have Ventus, HCP, and Well Tower. Well Tower is one of the ones they rent from. Um, so what's important here is actually on the second page, I su it's summed up at the last paragraph. I just wanted to go to, um, actually, I'm just gonna read that last sentence. That's where kind of our market rent indicator is gonna come from here. On page 40, under 2018 operations, this is in their 10K report, it shows 56,551,000 of lease expense. Uh, so we just have to divide that by the total number of units that are triple net leases, which they describe in their 10K, that comes out to 2,405 units. So we can break that down into a $1,959 per unit rent, market rent, and this would be a national average basis. So this is, by looking at these 10Ks, we can kind of um, come up with these market indicators, much like a survey. So basically we've surveyed this company based on their 10K report. This is their per unit market rent based on their 10K report. 
So that's one indicator of market rent. The following page is from Brookdale. This is another tenant that has triple net leases. Uh, there's quite a bit here in this, lots of quotes from it. Um, I'm going to skip to page, starting on page 26. So uh, from their 10K report, Brookdale Senior Living actually lists every single property that has a triple net lease. They list how many units is in each property. If you look at type as IL, which refers to independent living, and AL refers to assisted living. So that's most of them here. Every so often, I believe, actually just one of them, you see SNF, that means skilled nursing facility. And finally, uh, ALZ refers to assisted living, Alzheimer's, I believe, or memory care. So we have this long list of triple net lease properties. It comes, we can add up the units, 8,542 8, units. You'll see that on page 27. From their 10K, we can get their total rent. Uh, it's their 10K schedule one, uh, 143,305. We just do a simple division there. We'll get an annual rate. 16,776, monthly 1,398. So there's basically another market survey indicating what a market rent could be for a subject property. So that's the end of uh, basically the general uh, special research project that our office did. Now I'm gonna get into more of uh, the information I was able to obtain or what I was looking at. Uh, so I went through our assisted living facilities. I looked at our records to see, do we have any of these leases or lease rates or anything along those lines? I was able to find three of them. Unfortunately, all of them are considered confidential. It was received under 441D. So they do have to remain confidential, but I can share some information about these properties. I can say when it started. I can say when the lease rates are. Uh, basically, I took their lease rates divided by an amount, their number of beds, and you get three nice indicators there of market rent. I'm sorry, Mr. Phillip, can you tell me what page that's on? That's on page 28. Okay, thank you. Okay. So there's three confidential comps that we uh, are relying on. Next, page 29, I just wanted to summarize all of the market data into one summary here for us. Uh, so the first line is the subject's 2017 income and expense statement. It's stated, uh, if I do division by the amount of units at the property, it came out to 1,008 per unit as a rental rate. The subject's 2018, same thing, 1,240. Subject's 2019, 1,209. And then we have that um, table I was discussing earlier from the Well Tower 10K report. That came to 1,214 for 2019. That would be another national average or a, na a market survey, basically straight from the owner itself. Followed by Well Tower 10K report 2018, national triple net average monthly revenues of 1,069. Like I said, we had capital senior living 10K report. I discussed the 1,959 per unit, Brookdale 1,398. And then we had the three confidential comps. So based on this range of comparable comps and everything, we decided 1,209 was a reasonable market rate for the subject property. The reason being that's what they paid based on their operation expenses on their profit and loss statements. That's what they paid uh, in a lease for 2019. Also, the lease itself stated every three years that rate gets adjusted by agreed upon market rent. Um, so we felt that was a reasonable conclusion based on the market evidence available to us. Turning the page, here are some market cap rates that we use to determine the cap rate. Like I said, both the applicant and assessor agree on 6%. So 
So I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but these are available um, to justify the 6%. So I'm going to go ahead and skip over those real quick. Some of them are duplicates because they are um, uh, portfolio sales. So there's multiple properties in one sale. Um, turning to page 52, give you a second. So the applicant provided basically the first quarter 2022 or 2020 um, market survey that they used for their cap rate. Our office didn't have access to the first quarter. We had access to the second quarter. So a little later in the year. Um, but I also just want to include this as a source of information. That's what I looked at as well. I looked at the information the applicant provided as well. Um, but like I said, applicant and assessor agree on the 6%. Okay. So next, page 64. I apologize, I just realized I'm going a lot longer than I thought. <laughs> um, so next is the comparable sales. We have, so I just wanted to mention, if you look at the subject property, I have assisted living facility plus memory care. Uh, the applicant in his presentation mentioned they also have independent living, uh, which wasn't reflected in our records. So I adjusted my comps here. Um, the ones with independent living, I considered them superior and adjusted them downwards. Uh, but since the subject does have independent living, I believe the, these estimates likely should be a bit higher. I uh, unfortunately didn't learn that till today. So, um, but real briefly, like I said, the comparable sales can be a bit more unreliable because business properties include, or business value can be included in these sales prices. If you notice, I have three comps, sale two, sale three, and sale five. These are all in Ventura County. Now, I do actually feel that these comps are extremely reliable. I'll explain why. The, these properties, they had recorded sales prices with the recorder that the assessor can look at. They also wrote down these sales prices on our, the preliminary change of ownership reports. So the, the recorded sales price and our change of ownership reports both had similar sales prices. And finally, all three of these, sale two, sale three, and sale five, all had appeals on these properties for the transfers and they withdrew. So that tells us that the value we enrolled here are actually highly accurate. We believe we did cap properly capture the value of just the real property. Because these appeals were appealed and withdrawn, that tells us we didn't overassess the property, okay? So for the assessor's office, sales two, three, and five are very reliable. Uh, the others are outside the assessor's office, sale one, four, and six. I put them there kind of as a reference, uh, but like I said, I can't verify that there's a business value in those, and I'm unable to estimate a business value because I don't have that information. I can't get that information from CoStar um, as far as how, you know, the intricacies of the sale and that sort of thing. Um, but using a Comparable sales approach, you'll see after adjustments, I came to a valid conclusion of 21 million. Um, like I said, less emphasis on the comparable sales approach, but it does support our value conclusion as well. The remaining pages are just the CoStar information for these sales. And then the, uh, really the final page here is just the Sims v. Pope that I referenced earlier. I just wanted to kind of include this summary um, since I referenced it there. Um, so I'm going to now go back. Okay, so I'm going to go 
ahead and look at just real quickly, Assessor's Exhibit D. This is the master lease agreement that we received under 441D from the applicant. Assessor's Exhibit E is the subject's management agreement that we received. And finally, Assessor's Exhibit F is the income and expense statements that we received. And I know it's rather small. I couldn't get it to nicely fit on the page there. But what I wanted to point out is, if you look on page, I marked it page seven of 18. There is a line on that page seven. This is the 2019, and each year has it. I just wanted to point out where I got the amount of rent paid for the subject property for the lease. So it says, it's kind of small, but it says lease building. There's a number 80210. It's kind of one, two, three, four. The fifth line from the bottom there, you'll see lease dash building. So that gives us- What that, page again? As page seven of exhibit F. Sorry. Blue page numbers in the right corner, yes. and it's page oh, six is okay. six in the center. Oh, okay. Right, not, not the center numbers, the center. apologies. It's the, uh, the okay. blue one. Got it. Okay, yeah. Thank you. So if you look about the fifth line up, it says lease building. That's where we pulled the rental amounts from, from these income and expense statements. So I just wanted to point out where we're getting that information from. So finally, in conclusion, uh, let me pull that in there. The assessor's valuation follows the guidelines set forth and taught by the Board of Equalization. The assessor's income approach is supported by the actions of market participants. The assessor's originally, the assessor originally used the subject's operational income to enroll a value of 21 million for January 1st, 2020. Using the preferred method of market rents, um, sorry, the preferred method of using market rents is in agreement with the assessor's original valuation. Therefore, the assessor recommends the board sustain the enrolled value of 21 million as of January 1st, 2020. And that will conclude my presentation. Okay. All right. Um, we will take our lunch hour right now. Be back at. Um, Let's start back at one thirty. One thirty. You got it. Does that work? Okay. Right. Are, are our things safe in here? They are. Yes. yes. You're free to leave anything you want here, and the uh, room will be open when you return uh, just before one thirty. So you'll lock it up. Uh, yes, we'll be. Uh, security will be monitoring. The doors will not be locked. Okay. But we'll be, it'll, the room will be monitored.
All right, we're back from lunch break. The assessor has presented their case. We'll look for questions from the applicant to the assessor regarding their presentation. Uh, yeah, before we do cross-examination, we actually have a motion ourselves for the board consi to consider. Okay. Sorry we didn't give it to you uh, before lunch. <laughs> That's um, okay. But uh, I've got six copies of it written out. If you guys would like copies of it, I can Alrighty. go over it. Here you go. Actually, he's going to need... Thank you, Brendan. Brendan, you're going to need one more, probably. Yeah, it's <laughs> And what exhibit will this one be? Yeah, I was going to clarify, is this uh, yeah, based so, on your rebuttal evidence, it's probably yeah. pre-numbered, where would this fall? Yeah, so we usually have oral motions, so I just decided to write this out, but it has to be submitted as an exhibit. Um, if that's the case, it would be Exhibit 34. All right, thank you. 34. Okay, go right ahead. All right. So um, the assessor's office has valued the property as if the subject property is subject to a fictitious third-party triple net lease agreement. Um, under the State Board of Equalization, that, uh, by definition, that's an encumbrance, which conveys control of the property to a hypothetical third party. Uh, by definition, the assessor's approach is the valuation of a leased fee interest um, rather than a fee simple interest. Uh, under Rule 2A, uh, under our Exhibit 26, the copy of Rule 2, uh, paragraph A, second paragraph of paragraph A, um, states uh, when applied to real property, the words, quote, fair market value, end quote, mean the price at which the unencumbered or unrestricted fee simple interest in the real property would transfer for cash. Under Rule 8D, if you go back a couple pages on Exhibit 26 to Property Tax Rule 8, um, it states, in valuing property encumbered by a lease, the net income to be capitalized is the amount the property would yield were it not so encumbered. Whether this amount exceeds or falls short of the contract rent, and whether the lessor or the lessee has agreed to pay the property tax. So all this discussion of what the trip and the lease rates are, um, uh, it's irrelevant for property tax purposes because under Rule 2 and Rule 8, uh, you're supposed to value the property as if no such encumbrance exists. Um, the assessor's office did the complete opposite. Um, under Rule 8, it says that you're supposed to, that you can use market rents, um, but then further along the section, it says uh, ignore any encumbrances. They did the opposite and they value the property solely based on a hypothetical payment under a triple net lease encumbrance. Uh, Rule 8 states that market rents can be used and that lease encumbrances should be ignored. Um, instead, the assessor ignored the actual unit rents paid by the residents that we provided to them under the rent roll. Um, they ignored all those rents paid by the residents um, and came up with, uh, instead used the lease encumbrance, which was in between uh, intercompany, sorry, it was an intercompany transfer. Um, the lease agreement, and we can go over that if we, if we get there, um, there's no third party lease agreement here. Uh, all those uh, entities on that lease agreement were all subsumed by Well Tower Inc. So there is no third party rental payment. It does show up on the financials as a lease expense just purely for idea structuring purposes and for tax purposes. Um, that's why it's on there it is not an actual lease agreement. Um, even though the, the uh, agreement dates back to, I believe, 2014. Um, if you look at the agreement, all the mailing addresses of all of the, of the landlords, the tenants, it's all Well Towers corporate address. There's no third party involved. Um, but the point is, is that under Rule 8 and Rule 2, it doesn't matter whether it's hypothetical or not or whether one does actually exist, you're supposed to ignore encumbrances. Um, and so uh, the property tax codes are supposed to, we're required to file all sections of Rule 8, not just the portion that says use market rents. Um, it was entirely possible for the assessor to value the property based on the rents paid by the residents without encumbering the entire property under a uh, what if third party operating lease agreement um, that would take control away from the property owner uh, in violations of rules two and rule eight. And as a result of the assessor's uh, rule violations here, um, they're able to inflate the value by um, capitalizing that um, what if triple net lease payment uh, to get to a much higher value. If you looked at our, if our, if you looked at our analysis, uh, net operating income is much lower. Um, 
by ignoring that and just taking one line item out of probably 300 line items, uh, it inflates the value. And that's basically the gist of our differences in this analysis. Um, and if we move on with our rebuttal case, I can show you, and the assessor also testified in their case that they previously did value these properties based on net operating income. Um, we, agree, we disagree with some of the deductions, but this is how they've done it in the past. Um, so our value, um, our office value, the unencumbered fee simple interest capitalizing the NOI after all the required rule eight deductions, which was in compliance with rules two and eight. Um, the NOI we used was based on rental rates paid by residents living in the facility, not an intercompany um, agreement um, and not an encumbrance of the property. Um, and so we ask that you disallow the assessor's valuation for these property tax rule eight, uh, sorry, rule violations and rule in favor of the taxpayer who provided competent, compliant evidence that the true fair market value as of January 1st, 2020 is less than the assessed value. Okay, I'll let the assessor respond. <clears throat> And if you need some time to digest, that's fine too. We can take a short recess. Yeah, if you don't mind. Thank you. Right ahead. And Chair Little, while we're doing that, I defer to County Council on the uh, procedure, but unlike with the applicant's presentation, there's not a burden of proof decision to be made on the assessors because they have, uh, they're have they presumed to properly perform their duties. So what your board would normally do in a situation like this is take the applicant's testimony and then in your deliberations, put the weight you deem necessary on the assessors presentation, meaning if you agree with the applicant's presentation, you would put that weight on the presentation while you deliberate and not necessarily make a decision now under normal procedure. And again, I defer to county council. Yeah, and our, and our point is that if, if, this, if you agree, um, then there's no competent evidence at hand to support the current enrollment. Okay, I'll defer to council. Uh, the clerk of the board is correct that there's no real procedural mechanism to disallow the assessor's evidence in a case like this where the applicant has the burden of proof um, and that it really is a question of uh, the pros, the strengths and weaknesses of either side's methodology can be dealt with on the burden of proof uh, discussion after the close of evidence. Do you still like a brief recess? Okay. Uh, to the assessor's office. I think I've been able to gather my thoughts. So I, I'll, uh, I guess, respond in uh, kind of summarizing my presentation, certain points of my presentation. So one point I clearly wanted to make was that the assessor is relying on information that we have at our disposal. Part of that information is a master lease agreement provided by the applicant. I read through it. Uh, it at no point describes any, uh, I guess I've read the key points of it. All of it describes a triple net absolute market lease. I have no evidence to show that it's otherwise. Um, the second point I wanted to make is we, the in our evaluation, I wanna make it very clear we used a market rent derived from market comparables, the best comparables we could find, relying on basically surveys of 10K reports reported to the SEC. Uh, we had kind of a bunch of bullet points for what a market rent would be for the subject property. Therefore, we applied a market rent to the subject property, uh, the 12, 1,209 per unit is a what we determine to be a market rent for the property. Um, all of our valuation follows the Board of Equalization's guidelines. Um, and I guess I, I've read them, but I think I wanna point out a few specific parts of it, um, which I think would be best in Exhibit G, because it kind of has everything in there. Um, I'm gonna jump around here, give me one second. Okay, here we go. 
So very clearly, the Board of Equalization, Assessor's Handbook 502, Advanced Appraisal, there's a sentence here. So for instance, in this case, the, it seems the applicant has indicated this is not under a triple net lease. This is under, this is a owner occupied property, essentially. There's a sentence here that says, in the case of owner occupied properties, rental income can be imputed by reference to rental data from comparable properties. I believe I've demonstrated that in my presentation that that's what the assessor did. Um, the next, did you want to say something? Just when you're done. Okay. Uh, the next point I wanted to make um, is uh, when valuing property for property tax purposes, the relevant rent or is market or economic rent. Market rent is the rent a property would command, assuming prudent management, if placed for rent on market as of the appraisal date. Again, we feel like we've done this. One thing I wanted to, as it seemed he touched on in this recent document is um, the assessor should have used the rental rates of the residents, basically. Um, the, for property tax purposes, our valuation should reflect the ownership level, right? So by using the rents of the residents and that sort of thing, that's not quite the ownership level. We're looking at the business level, if we're looking at the rents in these rooms specifically. What we're talking about and what this master lease describes is the rent of the building in its entirety. All the comps we use are the rent of the building in its entirety, much like an office building, much like other commercial properties. We've applied similar principles from other properties for this property. We found that market participants operate in this type of arrangement, triple net leases on the entire building, not room to room. They, all these leases are structured this way. That, that's what the lease provided by the applicant describes. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to make sure we clarify there. It seems like he's conflating the two. We're not talking about room to room rents here. We're talking about the entire real estate property as a whole, which is how these triple net leases are structured based on you know, the information we have in our hands right now today. Um, I think that's basically what I would say about that. I'll allow Brittany. And I have a few more yeah. comments. If you yeah, can I just yeah. make one comment and then we go can right go over there? Um, I just want to reiterate what the clerk of the board and Mrs. Gardner said with respect to considering this motion at the present time. Um, the assessor agrees that while this information can be considered by the board and the information provided by Mr. Phillips can be considered by the board, it's most appropriate to um, have that discussion, take a look at that information once the um, cross closings, all of that is done, the case is over with. Um, at this time, we think it's still pursuant to uh, property tax rule 321 burden of proof um, is on the applicant and the assessor is presumed to have properly performed his or her, her duties. So, thank you. Okay, I'll allow sir rebuttal by the yeah, applicant. and the whole point of our motion is, is claiming and, and, re, and rebutting that uh, they did not perform their duties properly. Um, they mentioned that uh, the property, they mentioned the property is triple net lease uh, the whole point of Rule 2 and Rule 8 that we're mentioning, it doesn't matter whether there is one or there isn't one. It says under those rules that those are encumbrances, and you're supposed to ignore those encumbrances when you come to a property tax valuation. Um, it's, it's irrelevant even if they don't exist or if they do exist. Um, they, they mentioned that they were trying to use rental rates. Um, they were provided with the, uh, the uh, rent roll. They ignored all of them. No, they didn't use any of it. Um, and, and they mentioned the, that they were trying to value the property on the owner level, ownership level, um, as if the, as if Wall Tower doesn't receive those rents from those residents. That's exactly what they receive. They receive rents from those residents on a monthly basis. Um, they don't get a third party payment, um, on a triple net basis. If you look at their exhibit, um, page eight of 95, exhibit D, and you look at the top of the, uh, the amended and restated master lease agreement, the address for the landlord is 4500 Door Street. 
The address for the tenant, 4500 Door Street. One and the same. Um, there is no trip and lease agreement here, and even if there was one, under rules two and eight, you're supposed to ignore it and use rental rates. And that's what we did with the uh, with the unit rents um, that were reflected on net operating income. Okay, thank you. Um, to the fellow board members, I was just curious how we were going to handle this because the applicant stated this is a motion. So I guess I'll refer to council. Motion versus evidence. So procedurally, you would either deny the motion or grant the motion. Denying the motion would allow the case to just continue on questioning of the assessor's presentation, et cetera. If you grant the motion, that closes the hearing. You've ruled you disallowed the assessor's argument. So I think that the framing of the motion is to either deny or to grant the motion. Uh, the framing of your board's action is to grant or deny the applicant's motion. Okay. Okay, pleasure of the board. Do we need any closed session or? No, I want to put your mic on. Your feelings? Um, well, my vote would be to deny the motion. Okay. Uh, I also am um, denying that motion. Okay. Okay. Hearing, uh, hearing no objection, the motion carries to deny the uh, motion to disallow assessor's valuation. Now, another question to counsel. Um, is the, can the board consider this as evidence in our deliberations? This motion? Yes, you can consider it as evidence and argument in deliberations. Okay. It's okay. admitted as Exhibit 34, and it can be considered. Okay, so admitted. And then, Brandon, that'll be Exhibit... We've marked that Exhibit 34. 34, 34. Yes. gotcha. And I do, uh, again, County Council, since we don't have a procedure on, on this particular, we're going to treat a board member's Lunetta's statement as a motion to deny the applicant's motion to allow the assessor's valuation. And board member Cam seconded that. Is that how we're? You could do it the opposite way too. Is it because he specifically moved? It could be his motion, okay. and Lynetta's co comments constitute the the second and the vote. Okay, but it's a motion to deny motion the to applicant's deny. motion. Correct. Okay, so and that was by board member Cam, second by board member Lunetta, and there were no objections to that. <clears throat> right. Is that correct. All right. Thank you. That's been recorded. Okay. All righty. Okay, are there any, I guess we're at the questioning of the assessor. Correct. <clears throat> so Madam Chair and board members and assessor's office, we will try to speed this up because we'd like to get out of here before six o'clock. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Phillips, um, have you ever represented a publicly traded company in a buy sale transaction like this? No. Have you ever worked for a publicly ret uh, traded retirement community? No. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the 10K since you referenced that quite a bit in your presentation. Do you have a complete copy of the 10K? Yes. And, and do you know who that 10K is prepared and provided to? My understanding is the financial investors for Welltower. I'll answer that for you. That's not correct. It's the Security Exchange Commission. Um, oh, I didn't understand your question. Yeah, I mentioned that in my presentation. So in that 10K, and what's the date on that 10K that you have? I believe it said December of 2019. Okay. You have a complete copy of that with you today? Yes. <clears throat> Can you tell me what type of properties that uh, Well Tower uh, invests in, um, that they currently own or have, have equity interests in? I suppose I'd have to read it from the 10K. But I don't know off the top of my head. I don't pretty pretty long document, isn't it? It's a very long document. Yeah. You, you never drafted one, have you? 
<laughs> no. <clears throat> so you can't tell from that document and what you've pr uh, what, and what you've briefly read if that triple net lease comment that you made applies to all their properties, any of their office buildings, their medical buildings, their skilled nursing facilities, and their retirement communities, can you? Uh, I believe they break it out into each category, if I remember correctly. Uh, so you read that section? I believe so, yeah. Can you find that section? No, not right now. It's a very long okay. document. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Are you familiar with consolidated returns and consolidated financials? Yes. That 10K is on a consolidated basis, is it not? Yes. Can you identify the subject property, its profit and loss statement, and its balance sheet in that 10K? No. Did you try to look at the 10Q to see if you could find it? No, I just looked at the 10Ks. Do you know what the 10Q is? Uh, somewhat, but not extremely familiar with them, no. Somewhat. What is it? I'm sure you could tell us. I'm asking you. <laughs> it's not part of my present presentation. I don't see how it's relevant. Uh, it, it is, actually. It's, it's called the 10K for it's a quarterly. And on the quarterly, they don't do as much consolidation. And you will be able to find on the first four quarters versus the 10K being consolidated. So in the 10K, did you have a chance to take a look and see what it said about intercompany transactions? I believe it mentioned it in there, yeah. And what did it mention? I don't know off the top of my head. Do you, did you see anything in there about related parties? Yeah, I believe it mentioned something about that, yeah. And what did it say about related parties? Again, I don't know off the top of my head. So you don't know those items. Are you familiar with the term on a, on a 10K? on a do to, do from? I don't believe that Mr. Phillips presented any of this information in his uh, presentation. Uh, I beg to differ. Mr. Phillips uh, cited 10, the 10K as a lot of his basis for triple net leases and also for his uh, review of some of the financial transactions of the subject property. So it, it seems to me that Mr. Phillips has opened himself up to questions on the 10K. He cited to excerpts from the 10, 10K, but he, he, he cited to several of the issues that you're raising here on Cross. He just said that he identified some of those, but he couldn't address it, such as related parties, such as um, uh, intercompany transactions. But he said he read it, but he, he can't quite tell me where he saw it and what it meant. Did he say that he read it, or did he say that he uh, presented on it? Do you want to go back to the record here? If we had a court reporter here, I could get him to repeat exactly what he said. He said he saw those items in the 10K. And when I asked him what the specifics were on it, he doesn't recollect. Now, Mr. Phillips, a number of times, cited the 10K as a big portion of his basis for his analysis, especially as it relates to triple net leases. That's why it was important to understand on the 10K the different types of entities that Well Tower is invested in because he makes a blanket statement that the triple net leases are a majority of Well Tower's properties. Well, is that for medical office buildings, office buildings, skilled nursing, or retirement? He doesn't know, but he made a blanket comment. I, yeah, I, I, I don't want look, to get into my rebuttal. Look, I, I I'm going to object. We'll, we'll, this is we'll, totally we'll, beyond the scope of, of okay, Mr. Phillips' we'll, case please in chief. Let the okay, speak. hang on, hang on. Let's form your questions towards the assessor uh, I will. I, I presentation, only, make it more of a simple question that they can answer. Uh, I will. And, and my questions on the 10K are really related to how Mr. Phillips and the assessor's office has taken the position that a triple net lease is applicable to the subject property. And if it's applicable to the subject property, that means you'd have citations out of the 10K, 10K, 10K that would apply to the subject property, and it's consolidated. So that's a cherry-picking blanket statement that I just want to okay, review. Is this your rebuttal, or is this a question? This sounds like argument. Yes, I will not make it rebuttal. Okay. Uh, my, my last question on the 10K is, are you familiar with the do-to-do do from in the 10K for consolidation of retirement communities? 
So if I can, uh, there is a lot said right now. Uh, I just wanted to clarify one thing. He said many or most of the properties in the 10K are triple net leased. I didn't say that. I said they have a lot. There's a lot in there that they list as triple net leases. So I just want to clarify that. Well, we we okay. can play on words. Okay. You said many. Okay, let's pers let's go on. Yep. Uh, the other do you know what the do to or do, do from? to do from. Yeah, I don't I don't know what that is. It's related to related party transactions. All right, thank you. Um, and yes, what do you, you guys have a copy? Oh, hold on. Hold on. I'm a, there we go. Um, we're going to be referring to the binder that starts with Exhibit 5, and that's a copy of one of the exhibits that was presented during the December 2021. We do not have access. You don't have that? that? Okay. I was trying to remember what I provided, so hold on one second. Has Brendan been given a complete copy of the binder? Just before you, I just want to confirm, this is referencing something that the assessor will then be asked a question about that is in their presentation today. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. It's cross-examination documents. They're slippery. <laughs> Thank you. They already have one through four. So this will be exhibit 35, is that correct? So, so these were previously introduced at the December 5th, I think it was December 5th, 2021 hearing as exhibits 5 through 13. And I'm going to, uh, I will verify, but uh, I guess we'll just ask the applicant to confirm these are the exact same exhibits from that hearing, correct? Yes. Thank yes. you. Okay, so these are exhibits 5 through 13. No, they are exhibits 5, 7, 9, 10 and 13. Okay. And there's a table of contents in the front on that one. Okay. And sorry, just to confirm, these are exhibits that were not part of the assessor's uh, case in chief. These are from a prior hearing exhibits that were introduced by Welltower? Correct. But they are using it for their questioning. The questions are. I, my, my question to counsel is is this new evidence? I think we should, we're admitting it as part of this hearing, and so when Brendan creates the minute order in terms of what's been uh, admitted as evidence, these will be included. And then okay. we'll just need to make sure that the question relates to the assessor's presentation, even though it's evidence that's exactly. not part of the presentation. And so we, that's we for, that's yeah. for yeah. the yeah. chair and for the board to yeah, yeah, we just need to be very specific. Reel me back. Yeah. Okay. If, right. if, if you'd like me to just take a moment to explain why I, I discussed this with the applicant's representative, numbering wise, most of the, these exhibits were presented previously, and it's a, as you see, it's a large chunk, and they're now being presented again. So rather the administrative record for any future proceeding, having them in twice and possibly that being confusing, we agreed it would make most sense to just re reference the original exhibit. So in the final administrative record, they're only there once, and there's no confusion about it being, say, Exhibit 5 and 36 okay. in the administrative record twice. So that is the, the reason for this. Um, but they are now being presented fresh as set up for the questioning um, of the assessor. For that. And then, uh, while we're on it, just so then the, the proper procedure, if the uh, assessor does not want to answer a question, they should address it to you, the chair, rather than responding directly to the applicant. Thank you. Okay. Next question. All right, um, so I'm gonna be referring to exhibit five. And that's just an email that I sent to Mr. Phillips. It's just a copy of the organizational chart uh, for the property. And can you confirm, Mr. Phillips, you, you did receive this email, correct, with the org, org chart? That's correct. Uh, did you review the org chart? I, I have seen it, yeah. Uh, there's no third party in that org chart, is there? 
Uh, I see names with arrows. All consolidating into Well Tower Inc., correct? Is that what names and arrows mean? Mr. Phillips, do you know how to read an org chart? You did request one. I requested documentation showing how the properties operated. Uh, you sent me names and arrows. So this org chart means nothing to you? I don't know what it means. Okay. So you don't read that to say, Well Tower Propco Group, who is the current title on the real property, and Well Tower Opco Group, who is the lessee in the interparty company, all consolidate into Well Tower Inc., the same party? You didn't get any information from this? If, if that's what you're... If that's what this diagram means, then well, I'm that's trying to ask you for your understanding of the org chart that you requested, and you. I don't remember requesting an org chart specifically. Okay. Um, well, the reason I'm asking is, this is the org chart, whether you understand it or not. I'm trying to find in this org chart, you have a third party lease agreement that you're valuing the property on. Where is this third party tenant in the org chart? Can you identify one? That it's in the, I based it on this master lease that you provided. Yeah, but that wasn't my question. Can you identify a third party tenant in this org chart? Uh, I'm going to step in and say I think the assessor has already answered your question that they don't understand how this chart gotcha. works. Gotcha. So let's go on. All right, so I move on to exhibit seven. Um, this is a copy of the assessor's request to the Franchise Tax Board for the 2017 through 2019 income statement, or sorry, income tax returns uh, for Well Tower and Sunrise. Um, I've, I've tried reviewing you got a lot of documents here that you submitted. Um, did you use any of this information that you gleaned from these income tax returns in your analysis? So... This was discussed at the prior hearing. I don't see how this is relevant to the presentation today. I'm asking if you used any of this information in your, in your presentation. I can't find it. Well, you told us at the last hearing how we didn't get information from that. You already know the answer. Mr. Phillips, I'm asking a direct question. You requested the income tax returns. I'm asking, did you use it anywhere in your analysis that we could review? I'm... Uh, it's based yes on no. the last, you either did or you didn't. Based on the last hearing, uh, your question confuses me. But no, we didn't use them. We didn't get any. The franchise tax were never responded. They said, I believe it was does not exist or something like that. Okay. I can't remember the so exact. You asked for a document that doesn't exist. Apparently, yeah. This was discussed okay. at the last hearing. And. I'll move on. And you're aware of Sunrise. You asked for the income tax return for Sunrise. Um, I think it's clear in your presentation you, Sunrise is not a tenant of the property, correct? It's as described, it's the manager. If I could clarify, uh, the reason we asked for these tax returns is because Prior to the last hearing, and I, we've dealt with this prior at the last hearing, but we were unable to get the normal kind of required information from the applicant, and then the board ruled and told basically the applicant what information needs to be provided. So now that's why we're here today. All this was covered previously, so I'm just a bit confused by these questions. Yeah, the reason I'm asking is I, 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 I can move on. Uh, moving on to Exhibit 9. Um, this is a copy of one of the assessor's information requests uh, dated October 12, 2021. Um, if you look on page 3, Mr. Phillips, the bottom of the dotted requests uh, the third from the bottom, any market comparable sales that support a decline in value. That's, you remember making that request, right? Yes. And 
and we can move on to exhibit 10, please. I'm, I'm going through this section rather quickly to speed things up. Exhibit 10 is uh, our response to the information request dated November 3rd, 2021. Um, did you read this response, Mr. Phillips? Yes. Okay. Um, in our response, we listed three sales comps that we believe would support a decline in value. Uh, did your office use those sales comps in your analysis here? What page are you re referring to? Page four. Bottom of page four. Uh, we listed three parcels, sales comps that we believed supported a decline in value. Oh, yeah. Um, Great you, question. I have an answer for you. Uh, sales comps, if you look, A and B, the assessor used both of them in their comparable sales approach. Uh, I didn't use C, which is the foothills at Simi Valley, mainly due to the date of the sale was September 6, 2016. Uh, I felt that was a bit old, so I didn't include it in mine. You certainly can include it. What's interesting about that one is the price per unit before adjustments, uh, $297 $297,000 price per unit. Uh, that's before adjustments. That's actually higher than any of the comps used by the assessor. So that would indicate probably the highest indicator of market value out of all the available comps. Well, the reason I'm asking about C is uh, we represented that taxpayer. And uh, are you familiar with what percentage of the purchase price was allocated to intangibles? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. Look at that. So you didn't know it was over 30%? Oh, actually, I did look at that. Give me a second. I have my notes here. Yeah, so I looked at the value here. Let me look at my notes. So I'm showing that the reported sales for, sorry, one second. Okay, so based on what I'm looking at here, the notes say the P core stated a reported sales price of forty six million three hundred seventy seven thousand two hundred eighty three. Um, it says real property and personal property were included in that. Uh, we enrolled an adjusted sales price of forty four million eight hundred fifty one thousand. Uh, and that's what the Prop 13 value is based on. So that doesn't look like 30% to me. 46 million to 44 million, roughly. Okay, that's not the numbers I show. Um, that's the numbers yeah. I saw. All right, I'll move on, but that's not the numbers I show. Um, uh, you also testified that the uh, trip and that lease calculation that you use today is uh, the way your office values all senior housing properties, correct? Sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. I'm not sure what that was. Hold on, here we go. So your office testified today that the triple net lease calculation you used is the approach your office uses for senior housing properties? Yes. As of when? I don't have an exact date, but I believe it was starting... Pretty recently, right? around the 2021 roll years when this research was done and when we shifted our approach to the triple net leases. So what, how did your office value these properties prior to 2021? I explained we used... Net operating income, correct? Operating income, operating expenses, and I, the assigned appraiser would compare that to the, the ones that actually responded to 441Ds and come up with... So similar to our approach? I would say yes, but there's certain points of your approach that are odd to me that I don't, still don't quite understand. I, and vice versa. <laughs> so hold on a second. 
Uh, move on to Exhibit 13. Oh, while we're on, sorry, while we're on Exhibit 10, just go to the last page for me. The last two pages. Um, you mentioned several times uh, that you didn't get sufficient information. He had to work with very little. Um, this is the entire copy of the rent roll as of December 19th, 2020. You had this information when you were reviewing the property, correct? Which lists the room rates per day, target rates, and several other indicators such as uh, care revenue, um, days moved in. You had all this information to review the, the assessment, didn't you? Um, yeah, do you have a question about my presentation? I'm asking if you had this information when you reviewed and when you presented your present, or sorry, when you um, created your presentation. And you, you let me rephrase it. Did you use this rent roll at all in your presentation? No, as previously described, this rent right. roll would give us the operational value. We're trying to get to an ownership value of the property. And you see those as two separate things in this situation, even though there's a only one party? The based on the information provided, yes. Regardless of all the uh, mergers? Have you provided any information about the mergers? I gave you a copy no. of the org chart. You say you don't know, un understand how to read it. So boxes with words in them and arrows is That's equivalent chart. to merger documents? You never requested merger documents. You actually requested the original copy of the lease agreement, and then you said you want an updated version. And uh, when I talked to Well Tower, they said they don't update old agreements because they have so many mergers and so many properties that they use the merger documentation to support the change in ownership and entity names. And after that, you never requested the merger documentation, correct? Well, after that conversation, the communication broke down, and it was clear uh, based on communication with Brendan and I believe County Council that really no more information would be provided. So yes, I would have liked to request those merger documents or but you any didn't. other documents that show. Do you have any reason to believe those mergers didn't happen? I have no documentation to show anything of that okay. nature. Uh, moving on to exhibit 13. Uh, you mentioned you started doing this triple net lease calculation in 2021. I, I got a copy here of your Prop 8 reviews from your, from your county. Uh, this is just two copies from 2020 and 2019 Prop 8 reviews. These are estimates of the value using an estimated net operating income, correct? Not a triple net lease? Um, I believe so. Okay. Um, I didn't do this one specifically, so I can't a answer really specific questions about it. This would fit in line with your timeline that your property, or sorry, your county wasn't valuing these properties based on triple net leases at this time, correct? I, like I said, I believe so. Okay. Um, well, you are the one that provided this to me. Do you see any deductions in this analysis for intangibles? Do you have a question about my presentation? Consider that a non-responsive. I think I'll, I'll step in here and say, did you rely upon this form? No, this was not part of my. This was not part of my presentation. This wasn't part of my analysis. I okay. never really looked at this. Okay. Uh, the the I, I, applicant requested in assessor's records under can you remember, 408. So this is a what we consider a 408 response, which is uh, documents in the assessor's records for how, you know, basically how prior values were determined. Uh, for this appeal, it, it, I... You did guess, not rely on this. I didn't rely on it. I didn't... Okay. I hardly looked at it. Um, yeah, okay. that's all I can say. Okay. And just for context, board, um, this is the review their office did um, using... Similar approach to ours, um, they're now using a completely different approach and supporting the same value. That's why I'm asking about it in context of their presentation. 
All right. Uh, I've got a few questions about your comparable sales uh, analysis. Um, let me find the exact page. But how much weight did you give to that analysis, the comparable sales analysis? Like I said, I didn't give much weight to it because of some of the issues that I spoke of. What do you mean by much, much weight? 5%, 10%? Did you, did you do a weighted average of their your, your approaches, or was it just 0% weight? I guess you could say, well, they concluded the same value, so, but I put it all on the income approach, basically. So 100% of the value on the income approach? Yeah, the comparative sales is just a supporting document. It came to a similar conclusion. You say it came to a similar conclusion, but in your presentation you said it was mostly unreliable. I said it, the comparable sales can be real unreliable due to the, uh, the unknowns of if business property is included in the sales price and the difficulty of trying to calculate that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm looking at it right now. I don't see, on, I know you mentioned a couple of them you thought didn't have any intangibles, but for the remaining ones, I don't see any deduction for intangibles. That kind of fits in line with your prior statement that you couldn't really figure that out, right? Yeah, so the, like I said, I'll re restate it. Uh, the ones that are outside Ventura County, uh, actually, let me point them out again. One second. So if you, I'm looking at page 65 of the Exhibit C. Uh, comps one, four, and six are outside Ventura County. I would have given those, in the comparable sales approach, I would give those the least amount of weight. Obviously, I don't know what the business property that might be included in those sales. I don't have a reliable way of calculating that. Um, the points I wanted to make were the ones in Ventura County, uh, sale two, sale three, and sale five, all in Ventura County. They had reported, uh, recorded sales prices with the county recorder. They had listed sales prices on the P cores, preliminary change of ownership reports, as well as appeals on all of these transfers. All these transfers were appealed. So if the we tried our best to not include business personal property or anything like that. If we had, those appeals would have fixed that issue. Those appeals were withdrawn. Therefore, we feel the values we enrolled here are only real property, and these three would be considered extremely reliable sales, the ones in Ventura County themselves. The other ones, I agree, are unreliable. We have really no way of knowing or confirming if business property is included in those sales. But the ones in Ventura County, we're very strongly feel that okay, it's so real property only there. So if some of these comps include intangibles, that means the resulting value could potentially include intangibles, correct? On your sales comparison approach? Uh, not for the Ventura County ones, no. But did you use the other ones at all? Uh, they're there for reference, and they kind of help establish a range, but there's a possibility those are higher than the real property. So you have comps here for reference that you didn't use. Well, they're in there to help establish a range, but most emphasis was put on the Ventura okay. County ones. Okay. Uh, and the reason I'm asking is if your sales comparison approach includes intangibles and it supports your another analysis, if you got one bad number and another analysis supports that bad number, well, doesn't that make them both bad numbers? No, I've explained why the Ventura County ones are not bad numbers. The only thing on here that I mentioned is, um, so I did make adjustments to the comps that have, you'll see it's listed as IL, independent living. Based on our records, we showed that there wasn't independent living, just assisted living and memory care. Independent living is typically more valuable uh, than assisted living and memory care in the marketplace. So I did make negative adjustments to my comps thinking there was no independent living, but the applicant confirmed when he started his presentation, there is independent living. So if anything, I think based on these vent three Ventura County comps, I, I may likely, if I had known that, I might have concluded a slightly higher value conclusion because uh, I did reduce the value for not having independent living when it is independent living as well. So that's the one thing I would probably change on this comparable sales approach. All right, so just to be clear, the Ventura ones are sales one, four, and six? 
Sales two, oh, yeah. three, yeah, okay. and five. <laughs> okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, and I think we're all clear, the primary source of revenue in these properties is rents from residents, correct? That's the primary source, correct? So th that's a comparable sales approach, not an income approach. That's not my question. How do these properties generate revenue? The primary source of revenue is rents from residents, correct? Yes, that's okay. how assisted living facilities work. Okay, did you look at the um, net operating income um, of sales comp two in relation to the subject property? No, these are, this is a comparable sales approach, not an income approach. Okay, uh, under the sales comparison approach, did you compare the revenue generation of these properties to the subject property? to adjust your sales comparison approach. If one property is renting at $7,000 a unit and another property is renting at $4,000 a unit, don't you think that's relevant? Not to the comparable sales approach. No. Okay. We make adjustments for differences in unit numbers. You'll see that in there. The amount of units has an impact on. So rule four doesn't require you to, to make an adjustment on different levels of income generation? No, for the comparable sales approach, it's uh, assumed that they're all equal in income generation. So rule four doesn't require a, uh, an adjustment on differences in income generation. That's what you said, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, we'll move on. Um, we discussed rental rates. Um, uh, you had the rental, uh, sorry, the unit, um, the rent roll. Again, all these words mixed up. Uh, do you have any reason to believe that the uh, that the rents the residents were paying were not market? You, you talked a lot about you were trying to value the property on market rental rates. Is the property under rented to its residents? Did you provide any evidence to show that those are market rental rates? I provide you a unit. Uh, huh? Sorry, I provide you a rent roll. Did you provide any information? Yeah, this is, just a question. This is, oh, yeah. Answers question. Yeah, I provide you a rent roll. Did you okay, have anything? So as previously stated, using the rental rates would give us an operational value of the, I guess, business. We're looking for the ownership level of the real property. And what would happen if you used business value? Would that overassess the property? Uh, you would have to, like we've talked about, adjust for intangibles. To get to the real property only? Yes. Okay, so you would have you know, value X if you use net operating income, which would include business value, and you're saying you would have to deduct the intangible values to get to the real property value, which would be a lesser number, correct? Yeah, do you have a question about our presentation? I'm asking, you stated that you couldn't use the uh, actual market rents from the property. I'm asking you, and you said using that would be deriving a business value inclusive of the real property value. I'm asking about your statement and your presentation. You're saying, if I heard correctly, that you couldn't use the actual rents received from the residents because that includes business value. And what I thought I just heard you say was you'd have to deduct intangible values to get to the real property value, correct? So at Brook Hill representing the assessor's office, I think I'd like to clarify one point here. Um, the, the crux of the difference between the applicant and the assessor's approach is obviously that they're using the business income and the assessor is using the income attributable only to the real estate. The reason that the assessor did that is to isolate the real estate value from the business value. Triple net leases, represent the value only to the real estate. And so the assessor has done that. We've, we've found comparables of similarly situated triple net properties, um, and, and we've capitalized that to, to come up with only the real estate value. The assessor didn't use um, the operational income um, because it is very problematic in um, making sure you deduct for any intangibles or personal property or basically income that is not attributable to the real estate. Um, so the assessor's approach is very simple. 
um, and there's no need to go down this path. I don't believe that these questions are relevant to the assessor's presentation. The assessor presented uh, an income approach based on triple net lease rates. I'm just asking that we've got several versions of room rent. I'm asking them why they used the one they picked. That seems relevant. I've got a statement here that says room rents and they ignored it. The rationale of that seems pretty relevant. Okay, I'll step in here and say from my understanding from the assessor, they put less weight on the rent roll. They preferred to use the rates addressed in the triple net lease. Is that correct? Yeah, so the... Does that kind of boil it down? I think that pretty much boils it down. We're looking at the entire property as a whole as the owner owns it. And simply my question okay. is, you're doing that so that you don't get a value of real property and intangibles. You'd have to deduct intangibles to get to the real property value, correct? You said it once uh, before, I think, so I'll move I, on. <laughs> yeah, if you use the operational income, you have to make okay. a determination if there's intangibles included in that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Madam Chair, if yeah. I may, I, I said this in the very beginning of this hearing, that the difference between the assessor's office and our case is we've used actuals. The assessor's office has used a what-if triple net lease. Um, they've created that. Um, and that's the differences between our case. There's no triple net lease on this property. Um, the, the question would be, is if I was going to sell a condominium or an apartment building, would I go back to the Nelson Dennis case and ignore the rents that I have if they were long term and they were below market? I understand that, or a commercial building. But if in fact my rents were current, you would be buying, everyone in this room would be buying those apartment buildings based on the actual rents being paid by the tenants. The lender would lend based on those rents. The lender wouldn't turn around and say, well, let's inflate them and see if I can give you a loan on it. So there is a difference between the assessor's office triple net lease and the actuals. Yes, and that's why I said here. that in the very okay. beginning. Okay. All right, I'm moving along here. I've skipped a lot of stuff I had in here. So <laughs> for your benefit, for all of our benefit, um, I'm looking at your, your lease rate here, uh, about $1,407,276. Is that accurate? That's the lease expense you guys have that an, op that an operator yeah, would so pay? Yeah, that, so that, that would be 1,209 per unit times 97 beds or 97 units uh, times 12. So that would be one year of estimated rent there, 1407 So who's paying that right now? According to the triple net master lease that you sent, it was being sent to, I believe it's 4600 Door Street payment is being sent to 4600 Door Street. So the master lease says that the tenant, HCRI SL to TRS Corp is paying that to Simi Valley CA Senior Living Owner LLC. At the same address, correct? I, I guess so. Is that what you got from the lease? Right in front of you, page eight of 95. Landlord entities located at 4500 Door Street to HCRI SLII Trust Corp at 4500 Door Street. Isn't that a little odd? Oh, okay. So that's what you're referencing? Sure. Yeah. Is that a related party, you think? Uh, everything in this lease says absolute triple net lease, so I don't know uh, whether they're related or not. I don't see your point. They just happen to have the same mailing address, right? And Coincidence? Okay, I think we can move on. Okay. He answered your question. Okay. We, um, 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 I'm, I'm looking at an email here I sent to you on June 3rd, 2022, where you asked me a question about the lease agreement. Um, you previously stated that you had no idea that there were any mergers 
Um, I'm just going to read a quote here from this email. Please be aware of the following terms used within the lease agreement. Owner, Simi Valley, California, Senior Living Owner, LLC, merged into Well Tower Propco Group, LLC, on December 15, 2017. Quote, unquote, master tenant, HCRI, SLIITRS Corp, merged into Well Tower Opco Group, LLC, on December 15, 2017. Tenant, HCRI, Sun 2, Simi Valley, California, Senior Living, LP, merged into Well Tower Opco Group, LLC, on December 15, 2017. You don't have any recollection of receiving information on the merger? Uh, you, I didn't say I didn't know about the merger. You've told me about the merger. What I stated was you've provided no documentation regarding this merger. Uh, so based on the information I have in hand, I have a master lease that only refers to itself as a triple net lease. The subject property is in there. That's the information I have to go on. I don't have any merger documents. I don't have any amended leases. I have nothing to show me that this lease is somehow not relevant. Uh, also, just to be clear, the assessor used a market triple net lease from multiple sources that I've laid out. So we've applied a market triple net lease to the entire real property as a whole. That reflects the ownership level. The property at one point, looks like in 2015, or operated under this type of structure. Uh, based on the applicant's statements today. It seems they're trying to show that that's no longer the case. The assessor has no documentation to show that. Um, so we're basing it off of what we have in front of us, so. I'm looking at your lease payment uh, from, the, um, from some operator, Well Tower, to the owner, uh, Well Tower, of 1,407,276. Did you guys do any analysis to see if that meant any financial sense uh, to an operator of the subject property? Do you do a lease coverage analysis, something like that, to see if there'd be enough money to pay that lease payment? Can you state your question again? I'm not sure what you're saying. I can simplify it. Um, you have a lease payment of 1407276 Did you ever look at the net operating income of 1208580000 and think there's a shortage there? Why is... There's less revenue than your lease expense. Why is... Uh, why is 1209 per unit listed as a building lease in the profit and loss statement? Mr. Phillips, if you can answer my question, I'm asking if you looked at the million four lease payment you have in your analysis and thought, well, the property only makes a million two a year. If an operator signed on to this lease agreement, an actual third-party operator signed on to this lease agreement, if they only make a million two a year, they'd lose money every year if they paid a payment of a million four, wouldn't they? So, I can simplify. Mine. What's one point four minus? Sorry, what's one point two minus one point four? It's a negative number, isn't it? Uh, if I may, am I assuming here that Mr. Phillips had um, uh, consultation when he was preparing this analysis other than from, I'm not sure I got your name. Were, were you a party to his analysis or did you review that? My name is Brooke Hill and I'm a chief appraiser with the assessor's office. And one of my duties is that I manage the appeals team and so I did not take part in his analysis, but I did review it once it was complete. Okay, thank you. Just waiting for an answer to my question too, Mr. Yep. Phillips. Um, $1.2 million minus a payment of $1.4 million, the operators are going to be left with about $200,000 loss, aren't they? So I looked at market participants and their rents. I had a range of market rents and chose a market rent within that range. It happened to be the same amount that, according to the PNL, the subject property is paying to lease the building. Mr. Phelps, if you give me a direct answer to my question, I'm just asking, if a property makes a million to a year and they have to pay a rent payment that's greater than that, won't they lose money? I've answered your question. 
I don't believe you have. I, we're, we're curious to see where you come up with the extra $200,000 to cover the negative cash flow. So if I'm only making a million two, and you uh, have the position that I'm going to pay out a million four, where does the extra $200,000 negative cash flow come from? And we'll cover the operator's profit. I'm, yeah, I'm going to step in yeah. here. I'm, I'm not sure we're going to come to an agreement on this. So um, the board will review what has been submitted to us and put whatever weight they deem is appropriate on each item. And Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so we're going over all these payments and revenues. Um, under Rule 2, we're supposed to look at what a reasonably well-informed owner and what a well-informed buyer would um, assume. Uh, is it your guys' position that uh, buyers and sellers would ignore all of this operational data? Um, the resident occupancy of 91%, the actual rental income, um, the associated operating expenses, they'd ignore all that and come up with a rental payment that's greater than the NOI? Under Rule 2, does that seem like a reasonable position? So I believe we've answered this. So I, I looked at market participants. I looked at what they're willing to pay for triple net leases. I had an established range. I chose a rent in that established range. So that's my answer. So market participants are willing to pay more than they bring in. Just a simple yes or no. Sounds like it's a yes. Uh, like I said, I chose a market rent in a market range. The 1209 reflected what the actual property is paying in a building lease. Okay. I've only got a few more questions. Um, I know we're trying to summarize everything, make things, put things into uh, fruition here, but. Uh, just to get things clear, you're valuing the, a potential landlord's interest in a lease agreement, correct? The assessor is valuing the fee simple interest in the property. That wasn't my question. I was asking, you're, you're capitalizing a lease payment and the value of that lease payment to a landlord. Isn't that his interest in a lease agreement? When you capitalize a market lease payment as of the date of the valuation, in this case 1-1-2020, if that lease payment is market and you capitalize it, then you come up with the fee simple interest in the property. Yeah, I'm not sure the answer to if the question. If so. the lease amount, if the rent paid is higher or lower, then that would uh, represent something different than the fee simple interest in the property. Okay, so I'm looking at your analysis here and you're showing a payment that a tenant, these are your terms, a tenant would pay to a landlord and you're capitalizing that potential tenant's payment. That's not an interest in a lease payment, or sorry, in a lease agreement? You ignored the operating income, I get that. You, and then you took a, a master lease agreement and capitalized a payment on that lease agreement. So I'm going to quote the Board of Equalization. When valuing property for tax purposes, the relevant rent is market or economic rent. Market rent is the rent a property would command, assuming prudent management, if placed for rent on the market as of the appraisal date. It is the rental rate prevailing in the market for comparable properties. Market rent is typically estimated using recently negotiated rents from the for the subject and comparable properties. So Mr. We, Phelps, we're simply following the guidelines set forth by the Board of Equalization. Page one of your analysis, big bold words, subjects master lease. You guys are valuing a lease agreement, correct? So I've mentioned many times, we found, we looked at market participants, looked at triple net lease rates. We chose a market rent within that range and that's where our income approach is coming from. So you mentioned the market, so then why did you take the payment from the lease agreement? That was one of the points of the basically data points that we had. So you capitalized the payment that was listed in the lease agreement, correct? Right, it was, a like I said, we had... To derive that value of the lease agreement. So we have a range of market rents 
1,209 fits within the range of market rents, so we use that as our market rent to determine a value. All right, that, that concludes our cross-examination. Okay, are there any questions from the board to the, the assessor regarding their presentation? Okay. Make sure your microphone is on. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, Uh, let's see. Um, okay, Mr. Phillips, on page 26 of your appraisal, um, you're listing, what is this, Brookdale Senior Living, 2018 national average rental data. So we've got, um, and then I think on the following page, you have a summary. Yeah, average or annual rent per unit, monthly rent per unit just under $1,400. Uh, um, those leases, do you, do you know if any or any of them are pocket-to-pocket -pocket leases? Pocket-to-pocket, uh, -pocket. could you define that for me? Oh, uh, meaning related parties. Um, so just based on my understanding of their 10K report, these are, all these in this list are triple net to Basically, a, a REIT. So this is a this is a management company. Uh, the way REITs are structured, they have to either operate with a manager or they have a triple net lease with a manager, and uh, the owner can't participate or the REIT can't participate in the daily ongoing actions of the business. So that's what, those are the kind of two methods they can do that. So based on our research these should all be triple net leases between this management company and various owners or REITs. Um, so that's where this table is derived from. So you believe that um, none of them are between related parties? That's my understanding. Okay. Um, another thing I wanted to mention based on the applicant's questions, I'm not an expert at 10Ks, I'm an appraiser. So we're doing our best to extract market data from these 10Ks. Right. Uh, if, I, if me or anyone else in our office that was involved in this research project, if we made an error in our estimations from what we can gather of these 10Ks, then I mean, that's a possibility, but we feel pretty confidently that we can extract some sort of market data from these 10Ks yeah. that can give us a clue as to a market rent. Okay. So. Um, and then kind of, in a similar vein, you have uh, the the three Ventura County lease comps. Um, yes. Which are confidential, but you're able to provide um, the the numbers. Um, are any of these between related parties? No. And you know that definitively? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, just did you use the Simi Valley property as one of your lease comps? I don't have it in front of me. Um, uh, they're, they're, all, they're, all they're all confidential, marked as confidential, so okay, cause we wouldn't know that. Okay, because the issue we have with that mm -hmm. is that Tower has lots of properties. One of them could be the one of those confidential ones, and like I said before, none of their Sunrise properties that we have, none, no Belmont Village no, and no Oakmonts, the they'll all have that, that yeah, line that's, item of lease. Right, that's fine, but, it's um, right idea. but this is from the, the appraisers. Um, Okay. Uh, a presentation. They've marked them confidential. There's no way to know if it if they are, because they're confidential. So oh. I'm just going on what they're saying. Um, okay. They're testifying that they are not between related parties. Okay. Okay. And okay. Now my last question. You guys already answered previously. That's all. Thanks. Any further questions? Questions? No? Okay. Brendan, ref refresh my memory. Should we? Uh, so if questions complete, uh, mm -hmm. the applicant has a rebuttal presentation. So I don't know if you want to take a, a brief 10-minute recess until 3 and then 
They will present exhibits uh, for their rebuttal. Then we'll have questioning of that. And then uh, the assessor has nothing further to present, correct? Uh, that's correct. We just okay. likely might have some questions. but So then we would go to the assessor's closing, which would also be their response to the rebuttal, right. and then the applicant's closing statements. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, we're man, yeah, we're, we're man, we'll just burn it through this and getting it done so we can finish it today. And what everyone else agrees on that. Okay. Sorry, what was that? And we're agreeable to just running through it now and getting it done so we can get it done today rather than taking several breaks. Okay. If everyone's you're, agreeable to that. You're prepared? Okay. Yes. Okay, so we'll have rebuttal by the applicant. I do. <laughs> and, you know, I'll give you all of them all at once so we don't just keep going back and forth with the table of contents. There should be six copies of all of them. Each folder is one Each folder is, is one. one of, yes. Yeah. That's the easiest I could do it, and I, sta I paper clipped them. <laughs> Staple. Just yeah. remember, Mr. Porter, that it's individual exhibits. Yeah. yeah. I'll just hand them out if everyone wants to insert them in the place they go. Or? And the first one is just the table of contents you guys can add into there. So exhibits, uh, a table of contents was submitted for the exhibits along with exhibits 30, 31, 32, and 33. And then earlier we marked exhibit 34 as the uh, applicant's motion to disallow assessor valuation. These have been submitted into the record. Okay, submitted. Okay, go right ahead. We all ready? Mm-hmm. All right, everyone got their hole punched going in their binder? Yeah, we're good. All right. So I'm actually going to start off on Exhibit 26 briefly. Um, there's some detail there that I brushed over that's more relevant now, considering what the, what the assessor's office presented. Um, again, it's a copy of Rule 2. It states when applied to real property, the words full value, um, full cash value, or fair market value mean the price at which the unencumbered or unrestricted fee simple interest in the real property uh, would transfer for a cash or its equivalent under the conditions set forth in the preceding sentence. Um, you go to the next page, identification of the property rights involved, uh, section on the bottom. Um, there's a discussion on the following page. Uh, it's Assessor's Handbook 502, page 6, uh, that I've highlighted there. It says, all appraisals involve Evaluation of a set of defined property rights with few exceptions and appraisal of California property tax purposes involves the valuation of the entire fee simple estate unencumbered by any private interests. Uh, for example, leases, liens, easements, etc. cetera. Uh, there's a footnote there, footnote eight. Uh, it gives you a definition of encumbrance. Any right to or interest in land that may subsist or exist in another to diminution of its value but consistent with the passing of the fee. If you go down a little bit, um, it gives an example, um, second line from the bottom, uh, a mortgage, judgment, lien, mechanics, lien, lease. 
they give an example of an encumbrance. Um, and so uh, it says uh, rules 2A provides in part, when applied to real property, that's the section I just read, uh, unencumbered, unrestricted fee, simple interests. Uh, for example, a property encumbered with a lease containing rental terms that are below or above the current economic or market rent, notice the assessor mentioned market rent and what the rates were, um, a property encumbered with a lease containing rental terms that are below or above the current economic or market rent should be valued as if, as if it is not so encumbered, as stated in Rule 4. Um, that's another item from a comparable sales, but uh, convert the sales price of a property encumbered with a lease to which the property remains subject to its unencumbered fee price. Um, it's a lot of verbiage to say that, you, uh, that a lease agreement, like a triple net lease, is an encumbrance. You're supposed to ignore it. Um, and look at the cash flows on the property as if that agreement doesn't exist. Uh, the assessor's office, as we mentioned in our motion, did the opposite. They valued it entirely on um, a market rate for, a, uh, for an encumbrance, uh, like a triple net lease agreement. Um, and we, we, you know, if you look at the history of their uh, valuations, he said before 2021, uh, they used net operating income. Uh, I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, you scroll forward a couple pages to uh, Rule 8. Definitions of gross outgo. And if you scroll down, hold on, let me find it. Gross outgo does not include amortization, depreciation, scroll forward a little bit, or rents payable by the assessee for use of the property. That triple net lease agreement that they're using is a rental payment from a hypothetical operator for use of the property. I'm sorry, is it possible to just get clarification on where exactly we're looking in? Uh, yeah, um, rule eight, paragraph C, um, second sentence from the bottom. Gross outgo does not include amortization, depreciation, or depletion charges, debt retirement, interest on funds invested, um, or rents and royalties payable by the assessee for use of the property. Triple net lease calculation they're doing is entirely for the purpose of using the property. Um, it says here it's not even an allowable deduction under Rule 8. Um, they took that payment and valued the property entirely on that, uh, on that payment. Um, but under Rule 8C, it says it's not even an allowable deduction under gross outgo. Um, paragraph D, in valuing property encumbered by a lease, the net income to be capitalized is the amount the property would yield were it not so encumbered. Again, the assessor's office did the exact opposite. They valued it off the encumbered payment. Um, I'll go over there in a, in a few minutes. Um, under their exhibit, it showed a couple hundred line items of the net operating income I gave them. They ignored all of those line items and went straight down to the lease expense and valued the property based solely on that one line item out of two or 300 line items. They ignored the rental income, ignored the operating expenses, ignored labor costs. Um, and again, under Rule 2, you're supposed to assume that a reasonable buyer and seller would make these assumptions. Um, you know, we've, we've been representing these taxpayers for a long time. We've never seen any of them ignore net income, net operating income, gross revenues, uh, rental income from residents. I just didn't. Um, I'm sorry, if I didn't read it. Um, the last part of paragraph D, it says, uh, so in valuing property encumbered by a lease, the net income to be capitalized is the amount the property would yield were not so encumbered, whether this amount exceeds or falls short of the contract rent, and whether the lessee, sorry, the lessor or the lessee has agreed to pay the property taxes. So again, that goes back to the argument of whether it's above market or below market. It says right here, it doesn't matter, ignore it. Um, uh, we showed in our analysis, or sorry, in Cross, we provided them with the rent roll. Um, they talked a lot about trying to extract information um, from the market, and they ignored the rent roll um, with no evidence that they were being under-rented. Um, so let me scroll ahead to uh, the new exhibits here. Sorry, I believe that's exhibits. Thirty. Exhibit 30. This is a statement from the State Board of Equalization uh, written to um, a judge in Inyo County. Uh, it was written by, I forget if 
commitments. Uh, Robert W. Lambert, Senior Tax Counsel for the State Board of Equalization. And it's talking about, and at first I didn't think it was relevant, but uh, if you scroll through it actually is very relevant to uh, what the assessor is doing here. Um, the subject matter is sales price adjustments and applying the comparative, comparative sales approach. And most of it talks about comparative sales issues um, until you go to page, page six, bottom of page six. Um, and this whole document is pretty much him just writing under a number of hypothetical questions, answering the taxpayers' questions on, on, a, potential, um, on a potential assessment issue. Uh, number four here, it says, in valuing real property for property tax purposes, the fact that the contract rents for a property may be more or less than market or economic rents is irrelevant. Uh, Dennis versus County of Santa Clara. Stated another way, an owner who does not command the full potential of his property cannot expect his fellow taxpayers to compensate him for the difference. Clayton versus County of Los Angeles. And then he cites the same statue we've been citing in our motion and in our, and in our presentation. Property tax rule 8D, addressing the income approach to valuation is consistent. In valuing property encumbered by a lease, the net income to be capitalized is the amount the property would yield were it not so encumbered, whether this amount exceeds or falls short of the contract rent. And then in summary, he says, thus, the lawsuit that they're discussing over the amount of the contract rents due under the lease that encumbers the property is irrelevant to the fair market value of the property for property tax purposes. We've never claimed that these agreements don't exist. Our, our um, point is that you have to follow the property tax rules and do a property tax appraisal. And we've pointed out over and over again, it says to ignore these lease encumbrances. Um, Mr. Lambert from uh, State Board of Equalization uh, says the same as what we've been saying. Uh, exhibit 31. Exhibit 31, page two. Um, the assessor mentioned that this was their, or they provided to us as part of their Prop 8 review. He said that, that, his, that he personally didn't do it. Um, but this is, again, the example that uh, this analysis on page two. While we disagree, they didn't get to the right net income. And, uh, and obviously, we agree with some of the deductions because they didn't deduct any intangibles. But uh, this analysis has nothing to do with triple net lease rates. Um, they didn't do any triple net lease calculation. Uh, for that matter, they didn't do any deduction for uh, intangibles. Um, and they got to the $21 million value that we're contesting today. Um, so they used net operating income, which the assessor's office stated in a number of different ways, would include business values, didn't deduct business values, and then enrolled $21 million. So um, if you heard, you know, when I was talking about uh, valuing net operating income and having it include intangibles. If you have a valuation of net, net operating income and includes um, intangibles, you have to deduct those intangibles to get to the real property value. If you, uh, we have, that's a separate schedule. But um, without deductions for intangibles in this analysis, um, this doesn't comply with section, one section 110 either because they didn't deduct any intangibles. Um, but conveniently, the assessor's office is doing a completely different analysis using triple net lease rates to support this analysis. So while they say this analysis would include intangibles, theirs won't, but they're coming up to the same value. Uh, both logically cannot be true. Like I said, if you have a wrong number and then you do it the right way and you get to the same number, they're both wrong. Um, exhibit 32, uh, Mr. Phillips danced around this issue a little bit. Um, let me just read the definition of leased fee interest. It'll sound extremely similar to the assessor's valuation. The lessor's interest in property, an ownership interest held by a landlord with the right of use and occupancy conveyed by lease to others, like a third party operator that they are assuming. The right to receive rent stipulated in the lease and to receive the payment and versionary right at the end of the lease term. However you cut it, their valuation, it says it right on the cover, master lease. They're capitalizing the value of a lease payment. That's a leased fee interest, not a fee simple interest by definition. Um, the two are very different. They are not one and the same. Uh, exhibit 33 is an analysis I did for rebuttal just to show you, you know, what the differences might be 
you know, the assessor's office said if you use net operating income, you might include intangibles. Well, they didn't value the net operating income, income at all to see what that number would be, so I did. Um, page, or sorry, Exhibit 33, page four. Uh, this is a copy of the 2019 financials, and I just did this and said, look, let's value the, um, let's value the net operating income, and let's assume, for our argument's sake, uh, no one agrees with our workforce in place value. No value there. Um, so we took out that deduction. The resulting value is $16,655,802. So that $16.7 million is if you assume there's no workforce in place value. Uh, we still added back property tax. We did working return on working capital and capital reserves. But 16.7, that's just an example to give you of you thought that the working the workforce in place calculation was bogus or not supported. We believe it is, but just for argument's sake, um, this is the range we're talking about. If you start disagreeing with some of the calculations, um, if you move on, another four pages, the last page of Exhibit 33. This is if you disagreed with all of our intangible deductions and assume there's no intangible values. Another way to put it is this is the value of the property using the net operating income without deducting any intangibles. No intangible deductions. $17,313,064. No intangible deductions. Nothing for working capital, sorry, nothing for return on working capital and nothing for workforce in place. And if you notice, uh, 17 million three, that's with intangibles value is not deducted. The assessor's office is claiming that their value is real property only and they're coming up to a value three or four million dollars higher. So <clears throat> how could it be three or four million dollars higher uh, when you take the net operating income and you capitalize it, don't deduct any intangibles and you still get a lower value? I think that's our rebuttal, Madam Chair. All righty. We'll, we'll be prepared for closing. Okay, I'm going to look to the assessor for any questions that they might have on your rebuttal. Well, if there's questions on rebuttal, Madam Chair, that means we get to redirect again? Yes. Okay. Can we just have one moment, please? Mm-hmm. Sure. No questions on our end, thank you. All righty. Are there any questions from the board to the applicant regarding their, anything in their rebuttal? Yeah. Okay. Hi there. Um, so uh, normally when I think of intangibles, I think of you know goodwill or patents or trademarks. I'm trying to understand the return on working capital and uh, workplace, workforce in place. Could you give me a little recap yeah. of that? 
Yeah, so those come from Rule 8 and the Assessor's Handbook. So the working capital, return on working capital is specifically listed in Rule 8. Um, so that's what catches, should catch everyone's ear to it. Uh, exhibit 26, uh, one, two, if you go to, to the copy of Rule 8, it's towards the back, the last two pages. Very last line on the bottom. And this is relevant to the intangible deduction as well. You there? You want me to point it out, or are, we, are you finding it? Oh yeah, could you point it out for me? Yeah, so uh, are you on the Rule 8 section, uh, Exhibit 26, the last two pages? Yes. Okay, so very last paragraph on the first page. Uh, when income from operating a property is used, which is what we're doing here, sufficient income, and it goes on to the next page, shall be excluded to provide a return on working capital and other non-taxable operating assets Non-tax one operating assets, such as a workforce in place, which uh, the assessor's handbook lists. I forget in which exhibit, but there's a number of different intangibles. And you're right, some of those intangibles you mentioned are usually catch-alls like goodwill. Sometimes they say enterprise value. Um, yeah, name recognition. Um, but sometimes it's easier to identify specific intangibles rather than trying to get a catch-all because then you risk double counting some items. Um, if you have an enterprise value deduction, you might catch everything. And then if you deduct... Uh, workforce in place, well, some would argue that that's already accounted for in the enterprise value. Um, so the reason we try to hone in on the workforce in place is we have a labor cost, and we know that these properties are for profit. They want a rate of return on their expenses. Um, you know, we used a conservative, what we believe, conservative rate of return, um, and we made the assumption that they're going to make that rate of return on their labor expenses. Otherwise, why spend so much money on their labor? Um, if they're not going to make a rate of return on, they can just reduce those down to nothing, and you know they'll be hunky dory with the rest of it. Um, they won't be uh, because um, then we're back to the issue of the in place workforce in place um, portion of that idea is that a lot of the value is because every January first, every month to month, they have that workforce in place. There's no um, stoppages of services. Um, there's no gaps of service. Um, residents aren't going a few months um, without uh, their nurses, their cooks, their chefs, their um, uh, their care uh, providers. Um, so that's where the value comes in. And uh, like it said in Assessor's Handbook 502, um, you can't just deduct the management fee because that doesn't account for the burden of identifying your workforce, hiring them, training them, keeping them on from year to year. Um, as Dan mentioned, uh, there's annual... Uh, specialized training for these. Um, if I recall, there's a property in San Francisco, it's uh, still under California. They have to get certain uh, security clearances um, through certain departments um, at the federal level and the state level to be around senior citizens. Um, they have to have special training for uh, memory care individuals. Um, you know, I remember uh, one appraiser in one county said, well, you know, these are just uh, cooks and uh, and, and chefs and house cleaners, I mean, you could replace those easily. Well, in these properties, um, you don't just want any uh, cleaning lady going into your um, elderly parent's room without any training on how to handle, let's say, memory care. Um, they, might know, may, might not, may, they might know you one day and not the next day. Um, you, there's training for that that they provide. Whether it's helpful or not uh, is to be determined, but it's required by law. Um, and so there's a lot of things that go into the training of these, uh, these employees at all levels. Um, so that's where we get the value on that. Does that answer your question? Too yes, much? It does. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any further questions? I'm going to piggyback on that because <laughs> that was one of my questions as well. Um, so let's see. Um, I think I think you explained, um, you know, again why these intangibles are in there. 
Um, for the um, return on working capital, you used a conservative 3%, um, and I believe that was three months. Yeah, we took a three-month estimate. That's like saying, uh, you know, a property like this would want three months cash on hand right. to make sure they pay all their vendors, make sure they make payroll. Um, you know, again, we mentioned COVID. Obviously, this is, you know, the, the, the lean day is January 1st to 2020, but that was a good indicator. Um, a lot of counties before COVID would argue with us that there's no such thing. No one needs working capital. And uh, it's one of those things where... Um, you know, no one thought that it was valuable until they realized it was valuable during mm -hmm. uh, a worldwide pandemic. <laughs> and they realized, okay, there are reasons to have these things. Uh, there's also fluctuations in business. You know, if you have certain turnovers at certain times, you're going to need extra cash on hand. You're not just going to assume that you're going to get all of your rental payments in time to pay those operating expenses. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a, not a, they also have insurance policies, but it's another insurance policy to make sure you have cash on hand. So look at working capital as avoidance of business interruption. Right. And again, you used a 3%. You equated that to like a money market. Yeah, yeah. So and like a kind of a safe rate? Yeah, yeah. And, and now it's, it's ticked up to 4 or 5%. <clears throat> um, we used to use uh, a higher rate, but uh, uh, we think 3%, 3% is actually lower than what we've used in the past. Okay. Um, but 3% uh, is definitely something that was attainable. At the time. Okay, so then going to um, workforce in place, um, in that case, you used uh, 7.1, which is um, also the cap rate. Based um, on the cap rate, yeah. Yeah, why, why that? And why, why the difference? Yeah. So uh, think of a money market account. Um, it's like the difference between the federal funds rate. It's the risk-free rate uh, of a federal T-bill. Operating an assisted living facility, let me rephrase this. Uh, look at the T-bill. Let's say the T-bill is at 2%. That's the risk-free rate. The more risk you add, it increases your uh, risk premium in the uh, market rate of return formula, mm -hmm. finance stuff formula, and it increases your uh, risk beta. So the more risk you have, everyone knows the more risk you have, the more money you make. It's because it changes the interest calculation and rate of return calculation. Um, and so the more risk you have, uh, the higher the rate of return. And so that's, uh, for example, why independent living alone has a lower cap rate because there's less risk. Mm -hmm. Assisted living facilities are a little bit higher. And then when you go on to full memory care or full skilled nursing, there's more and more risk with that considering the nature of the business. So skilled nursing, sometimes you see above 10% and be 11 or 12% because of the risk of the business. So that's why there's a difference. Money market rate is, more of a, is, is less risky. Uh, cap rates are based on the risk um, of the particular uh, property type. And this is directly related to, again, the workforce in place. So you're saying yeah, it's an estimate riskier? Of, yeah. It's oh. a riskier place to put your money is in the workforce in place? No, no, no. No, <laughs> no the rate of return is based off the facility as a whole. Okay. It's not saying that's a rate of return specifically for the workforce. It's as a whole in general for the Right, property. I'm saying, but in, in theory, I guess if we're comparing one rate to another, if they're the same, yeah, then there putting, should be some similar risk. Putting your money into a workforce is riskier than a money market account. Okay, yes. so you're, you're saying that it's similar to the real estate, basically. Similar, yes. Okay. Mr. Lunetta, if you can look at it this way, <clears throat> if you bought a business and every employee left the day you bought the business, how long is it going to take you, depending on the type of business, the more technical the business is, the more difficult it's going to be for you to be able to replace and be up and running? How long is that going to take you? Well, when you've got a skilled and trained workforce that's in place in a retirement community, which you would never think that they've got to go through OSHA requirements, they've got to go through health and, health and safety, CPR testing. Um, we even found, <coughs> excuse me, that the dishwasher at the cafeteria in the retirement communities had to have specialized training, not just for himself of burns, but to be able to help a senior citizen out in the event of a medical emergency. Also special background checks as well. So you, you really have to ask yourself, how many months would it take for me to replace these employees? If you had, you go into a grocery store, Ralph's or Vaughn's or Safeway, and the employees go on union strike, you see management working, and they're struggling to perform some of the functions that the rank and file 
uh, perform. Well, maybe that's not as technical, but it's going to take some time. Mm -hmm. And we have looked at it, and we've argued in some counties um, three to four months, and a lot of the counties argue with us that that number is too great. Mm -hmm. If we did three months on this, that training and experience workforce would have been worth $900,000 to train them and replace them. There's over 100 employees. So what do you think it will cost you to replace that trained experience workforce so that you're not losing any cash flows? And that's the whole purpose of strikes that you see in union strikes. It's let's see how you can do without us immediately. Mm -hmm. Not well, usually. <laughs> and you have to bring in someone <clears throat> immediately that's trained. The whole point of this is accounting for all that. Got it. Okay, well, thank you on that. Let me just double check, see if I had any other ones. Uh, okay. I do. Okay. Um, so, um, I think in your Income expense statement, and or actually, I'll just ask you: Is the rental payment included in that? The rental payment. Um, uh, Are you talking about? So the confusion here is that they're using rental payment <coughs> as the triple net lease in our company transaction. We're using rental payment from the actual rents that the business is receiving right, from but, residents. But so uh, which you wouldn't that still be? An expense? Is that not an expense for the um, either the management company or the owner or the, the lessee? So, so how the how the property works is uh, they receive rental income from the residents, it gets covered in gross revenues, and then there's net op there's operating expenses that are listed, um, which do not include a lease payment. And then below lease payment, there's in a there's intercompany transactions that we don't include because under Rule Eight. They're not allowed, and includes items like interest expense, not allowed, depreciation, amortization, neither is allowed. Um, Rule 8 says lease expense is not included in gross outgo, not allowed. Um, so if you're referring to their lease payment, it would go from a hypothetical operator to the hypothetical landowner. In this situation, they're one and the same. In all idea situations, they're one and the same. Even though they have that line item, um, there's different entities. They have to report differently. It's uh, what it's called as a taxable REIT subsidiary. And for income, income tax reporting purposes, they have to... Um, I, I, t I spoke to the director of tax at Welltower, and they said that's just a mechanism for them to transfer some of the income from one entity to another for income tax purposes under RIDEA. Right. Um, there is no economic... They get no economic <laughs> benefit from it. It's in, out one pocket and in the other. Yeah, I understand. So, so when it consolidates... Uh, Mr. Lunetta, and I had asked this earlier in the do to, do from, when it consolidates for, uh, for accounting consolidation, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the one entity has a liability to another entity, and the other entity has a receivable from the other entity, and when it collapses and consolidates, they zero out. So that when you get it up to the income tax side to file the income tax return, you're only reporting on one net income. Not there's no double, right? There's no extra income. Right. It gets consolidated. It, it's, it's the equivalent of having two. Uh, let's. Just, I don't know if they have two <clears throat> accounts, but it'd be like having two checking accounts and transferring, you know, a thousand dollars from one account into another. It's one of those. Is is there a value there? Is there any economic transaction <clears throat> there? No. Right. So it's basically just we're talking about accounting for that. Yes. Do to and, do and from. In, yes. Yeah. Is the term. Yeah, and if you notice the line and it says lease for building, mm -hmm. uh, the lease agreement. It doesn't say lease for building. It says this is lease for land, building, you know, so and so. That's just how it was worded back in 2013 or 14. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we're not claiming that these agreements don't exist. Um, but under Rule 8, you're supposed to ignore them and value the property as if that whole messy <coughs> entity transactions don't happen. Uh, they want you to look at the primary revenue generator of the property. In this case, their primary business is renting. Uh, to residents, and so that's what we valued. Okay, um, and then my last question is: is this? Um, can you shed any light yeah. 
on. So, so there is a lease. It, 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 it's, you know, it's between related parties. It's essentially the same party, but there is a lease, and it's highly detailed. Um, do you have any idea where they came up with that rent number and what it represents? Yeah, so I asked them if that represents the market rate, and there's no... So there's, under the assessor's handbook, it talks about a number of items for a market transaction. Uh, I believe it's, it's got to be arm's length. This is not. Um, it's got to be subject to market participants. This is not. Um, and it's also got to be between two parties who are trying to um, most benefit themselves. Well, in this situation, they are one and the same. Um, yeah, I understand yeah. that. But my question is, do you, do you have any knowledge or can you shed any light on where yes. they come up with that number? Yeah, so I asked them and they said that what they actually told me was even though it says, I don't, I don't recall the section they mentioned where it changes every year, but the information I received from Wild Tower was that it was a fixed amount. That's why some years uh, it shows a loss at the end. But uh, it's a fixed amount that they try to determine um, just to transfer the net operating income from one entity to the other. Um, there's no, they don't do any market research to, it doesn't go out to the market, there's mm -hmm. no bid on it. Okay. Um, and, and it doesn't create any economic gain to them on a consolidated basis because when it consolidates, if, if you understand consolidated mm -hmm. accounting, um, it nets out. Right. Right. So That's the parent a, company's not going to get to take a loss, right? and they're not going to have to report any extra income because it washes when you pull the entity at the lower level, probably a disregarded entity mm -hmm. for California purposes because it's only got one shareholder or one partner. It gets disregarded for federal purposes, and it flows up to the parent company. It washes. Is there any, are there any tax benefits that accrue to... Uh, that, that are directly related to the amount of rent that is stated in this pocket-to-pocket -pocket lease? It will not. The only thing, and I understand this pretty well. I'm an enrolled agent out of the service. Um, uh, on a consolidated basis, the only benefit that the parent company would get on the consolidation is the depreciation deduction that would flow over. Okay. Net. And then also under the right day, it just changes which entity reports the income. Okay. Um, and, and then finally, just uh, again, and this is just whether you know it or not, um, I'm, I'm curious as to why the lease is so detailed if it is a related parties. Yeah, if you see the prior names, it could be very well the case that the prior owner was under a triple net. I don't know if it was or not. Mm -hmm. um, but as we said, after they acquired the property, they subsumed all of those entities into Well Tower Inc. Um, but the point of our of our Rule Two and Rule Eight uh, citations and Exhibit Thirty was, you know, it says several times under all these State Board of Equalization documentation that all this discussion about you know tripping that lease here and there it's not really relevant. Well, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I understand your argument there. Yeah. Um, uh, I would it would be relevant to me only in the sense that if it, if it were a market mm -hmm. lease, then it would be relevant. <laughs> Um, because okay. it would be indicative of market rent. It'd be one piece of data, but it would still be indicative of market rent. Um, I understand that what you're saying is it is not a market even lease. If it, our, yeah, our point is even if it was, um, Rule 8 says if the property is encumbered, value it as if it's not. Right. Whether it's uh, above or below market which, rates. Which I take that to, to mean maybe something a little bit different than what you're stay, saying, and that is that um, you can have a lease on a property. Um, that doesn't mean that if you value it via an income approach that you are taking into consideration the lease. It means you're using an income approach to come to, as Ms. Hill mentioned earlier, uh, a fee simple value. And so that's why I would say it's yes. relevant only as a, as a piece of market evidence. For as an allocation. To what, yeah. Yeah, so we have seen those done as allocations. But uh, I was going to mention it in our closing, that's usually done to allocate the land. Um, but we, we have one or two, uh, I believe, I'm trying to think here. The, prop, the counties that use this method, or the appraisers that we have that use this method, uh, ironically, the um, lease rate that's used is significantly higher than the actual net operating income. So in that situation, you can't really use it to allocate because you're saying, 
all right, I've got 120% of the value of the Nen OI. <laughs> I right. You can't allocate it. And Which so, my guess would be that it's yeah. not, that's not a market yeah. rent. Yeah, and so, like, for example, rate. San Mateo, um, they do it to allocate. They don't mention any triple net lease um, rates. What they do is they do a uh, um, lease coverage ratio, and they say, and they use a lease coverage ratio of three to five. Lease, lease, lease coverage ratio, by that I mean uh, net operating income over the lease obligation. It's basically a metric to see how much NOI do I have compared to the lease obligation. You want to make sure that it's above one so that you at least have enough NOI to cover your lease. Sure. San Mateo uses between three and five. Um, the rate the assessor is using here is less than one, which means there aren't enough NOI to cover the lease payment. So you can't use it to allocate because you're just completely ignoring the NOI portion of that calculation. Okay. All right. Um, that. Yeah, I have no, no further questions. Thank you. Yep. All righty. Now we will have closing and rebuttal from the assessor. All right. I'll uh, attempt to try to summarize all the issues here. Um, so I'll start with the assessor's, um, I guess, valuation and why we did what we did. Um, so there's a few things I want to say, and that's... Uh, the assessor applied appraisal techniques that we apply across the board to all commercial industrial properties. Um, we followed the guidelines set forth by the Board of Equalization, property tax rules, and the assessor's handbooks, what's actually taught in our courses that we're required to take through the BOE. We followed those guidelines. You know, the the primary approach in the income approach, the preferable method, is you apply a market rent to the subject property uh, based on you know, market participants at the ownership level. That's very important in this case. It's at the ownership level. Owners, these REITs, um, a certain portion of their por portfolios, which translates into actually a quite a large amount of properties operated under triple net absolute leases. That's what we could gather from 10 cane reports. That's what we gathered from the master lease that was provided to us for the subject property. So based on that research, we know, oh, there's quite a large handful that where the market participants participate as triple net leases. So based on this market data, we established a market range for the rents, just like we do for all properties in Ventura County. We applied the normal vacancy, normal expenses, and capitalized it. Um, we didn't treat the subject property any different than we treat any other property in Ventura County. Um, where there's owner-occupied properties, the Board of Equals, and I think I highlighted it earlier, Board of Equalization says it's appropriate to apply a market rent for those owner-occupied. Where they're not receiving a rent, they occupy it. Um, the applicant keeps mentioning we cannot value the property based on its lease, what its, its encumbered lease. We agree. So one point I wanted to make and I guess read from, I haven't mentioned it yet, but Assessor's Handbook 501. Rents are, in effect, sales prices for short-term rights to use property. Appraisers apply these short-term sales prices in the income approach to obtain value indicators. So my point here is when we're doing a comparable sales approach for the assessor's office, we have a sales price. We compare that to market comparable sales. We see if the sales price falls within range of our market comparables. And then we determine, is that sales price a market sales price or not? If it's not, we enroll what we determine is a market value. This translates to leases. So a lease is equivalent to a sales price to use the property. We've, what we did here is we took the subjects, what we perceived as the lease, uh, perhaps we're wrong in that, that's a possibility, but we didn't have any documentation or support or clarification on, in that profit and loss statement, it says 
building, lease, and a number. Like I said, communication broke down. There's plenty of other information I would have liked to know as I worked this property, uh, but that looked like, based on communication, that was not an option anymore. So I was forced to use what I have in front of me. So I had this number. It looked like a lease to me. I had a master lease agreement that says everything about an absolute triple net lease. I have nothing to indicate that it's a pocket to pocket, anything like that. He says, the addresses are the same. So that, there you go. And I, nothing in that lease reads like that. The lease is very detailed. Describe, I pointed out certain facts in it, but one of the points I wanted to make again is the lease itself says every three years it's going to be adjusted to a market rent agreed upon by the owner and the lessee. I don't know how else to interpret that. Um, it seems plain to me. So based on what I had, I had this triple net lease. I had an operation operating profit and loss statement, and at the bottom it says building lease. So I took that, like I do other sales prices for other properties or other leases for other properties, I compared it against the market. Where does it fall in range of the market? It falls actually pretty close to the bottom, but it's in the range. It's right there. Um, so for me, I said, okay, there's my market rent for a triple net lease for assisted living facility for the entire building. I'm not talking room rents. Um, then, because we were able to determine a market triple net lease, we can capitalize it like normal, and we don't have to remove intangibles because board of equalization is very clear. When you're using market rents, there's no intangibles. You're just talking about real property. That's what we did. Um, one of the points he's brought up is, oh, according to their financial statement, their NOI is less than this rent you've chosen. Okay, that might be true for 2019. If you look through my exhibit F, we have two other years. Uh, we have 2018 and 2017. 2018 had a higher rent, which I outlined in my exhibit. I believe is just slightly higher at 1,200. If you turn to, uh, so for 2018, if you turn to page 12 of 18, it's that blue on the top right. Um, you have lease building totaling 1 million four and change. If you go up slightly, you got NOI slightly lower than that. So that year they had a profit at that lease rate. If you go back one more year, 2017, that last page there, page 18 of 18, we have lease building again, totals just shy of 1.3 million but you got an NOI of almost 2 million, so they have a significant difference there. So my point there being is the NOI from year to year will fluctuate, but what we're using here is a market triple net lease, and maybe some years it's slightly higher, but other years, like 2017, it's significantly lower. They saw a lot more profit that year. Um, so that's one point I wanted to raise regarding using our market lease. Um, the information supplied by the applicant, the assessor did look at, um, obviously we would, I did have more questions, but was unable, unable to ask them. But the issues we saw were, they used actual income and expenses. We didn't see any evidence that they compared that to comparables. Uh, our understanding of Board of Equalization, what they outline is even if you use operating, the actual operating income and expenses, it still has to be compared to comparables. And we tried to outline that. We didn't see that the income was compared to comparables for reliability or the expenses. Um, 
The other issues we had is their calculations. So calculations on return on working capital, return on workforce in place. Um, these calculations, I tried to ask, where are these equations coming from? Your, you know, A times B equals C. There's equations associated with these. Where are these coming from? They didn't really have an answer. They had one answer for a mine that comes from Assessor's Handbook for mining. Part of that equation explicitly says months, uh, what, the exact phrase, I don't know, but months in the tube or something like that, months of petroleum in the tube, and that was part of the equation. So that didn't quite make sense to me. So there's a lot of calculations they're making that I'm not really sure where these calculations are coming from. I don't know if these are standard, you know, industry standard calculations. I didn't, didn't see anything like that. I don't see any market supportable data that shows, hey, these are how these should be calculated or these are reasonable values for these calculations. I didn't see any support there. Um, <clears throat> The other issue, um, oh, the other thing I wanted to mention is I have seen other fee appraisals or outside appraisals provided to me that do try to do intangibles. They don't use these equations. The method they typically use is they do the operating income and expenses. They come out with an income approach value for the business operation. Then they subtract that from a cost approach, and the difference shows the business value or the intangibles associated with the property. That's the method I've always seen from fee appraisers or outside appraisal. Um, like I said, the assessor doesn't typically or routine, routinely calculate these because we typically operate from a um, market rent perspective where intangibles are not included. Uh, but that's what I've seen from 30 party appraisals, a, a method for trying to come up with intangibles um, where you compare it to the cost approach and the difference tells you the intangible value. What the applicant has done, honestly haven't seen before. I have no way of verifying if these are accurate calculations or not. Um, <clears throat> let me see here. Uh, So I guess in closing, the, it seems the applicant is indicating that, you know, not just for the subject property, but kind of properties across Ventura County, we've been uh, valuing them wrong for many years because we sometimes do evaluate the leases, we, we apply market rents, that sort of thing, triple net leases to all sorts of property types, including the subject. Uh, the applicant seems to, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but he seems to indicate the way the assessor has been valuing these properties for years is incorrect. Um, I'm not really sure what to say about that other than I've cited all the, as many uh, sources I can from the BOE that kind of explicitly say how we are to value these properties, what the preferred method is. That's what we've applied to the subject property as well. Um, he's also referenced how we appraised it in the past. He mentioned I'm, I'm here to defend what was done in the past or what was enrolled for 2020. I just wanna be clear, I'm not defending that approach. I didn't look at that approach. I am defending my appraisal, I'm defending my value, 21 million. That happens to line up with what was enrolled. Um, sometimes that doesn't happen, that's why we stipulate a lot of times when we do an appeal. Uh, but for this subject, I plugged in all the numbers basically, it came out with 21 million. And I thought, oh, well unfortunately there's no reduction here then. Um, Another thing I wanted to point out, sorry, I am a little long-winded, but there's a lot of uh, stuff discussed today. Uh, and I think it's important, the history of the subject. So back in 2013, when this transferred ownership, 
we determined a market value of 20 million. That was appealed and withdrawn, so we feel that 20 million was an accurate value. Back in 2013, we're now at 2021, where we know, or sorry, 2020, where we know market values have changed since 2013. 2013 was relatively close to the recession. There was a lot of recovery from 2013 to 2020, lots of increasing. We know for assisted living facilities, these have been increasing significantly. The reason we know that is what I described. We've had, um, sorry, I need to consult my notes for that. Um, approximately nine new assisted living facilities from 2017 to present. That's significant. That shows they wouldn't build nine new ones if we've been decreasing from 2013 till now or 2020. So the market participants see that this is a high demand property. They're responding by building new properties. So going from 20 million in 2013 to 21 million to 2020 doesn't seem that far of a stretch to us. And for 2019, it was stipulated at 20 million. So we do feel that, you know, values should make sense from year to year. You know, we're not going from 20 million in 2019 and dropping to, I believe it was around 12 million. You know, it's got to make sense. Why? Where is that coming from? We didn't see that portrayed today. Based on what I can see, what I have in my hands, the documents that I have, 21 million supported. Um, so I think that's all I can really say about it. Uh, do you guys have anything else? Then? Yeah. So I think that that's our conclusion. OK. Thank you. And now closing from the applicant. Closing. We're going to get out of here by 4 o'clock, maybe. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Keep this short and sweet. Um, one of the things I noticed he said was uh, they haven't seen our analysis before, uh, except during his uh, cross-examination, he mentioned that they use net operating income uh, forever and in a day before 2021. So if this appeal would have happened about three years ago, we would be arguing over uh, net operating income and what deductions to make from it, like we have presented today. Um, instead, uh, they've seen the light in the last two years. They are now doing it on a completely different approach. He said he's not uh, supporting any other prior, prior years, um, except then he mentions the 2013 analysis, which used net operating income and didn't deduct any intangibles for working capital, workforce in place, or uh, capital reserves. Um, so that could account for the differences from 2013 to now, is that we're actually trying to resolve this issue of intangibles now. Um, the fact that prior years weren't appealed is not relevant to today's hearing. We're basing our appeal and uh, with the evidence before the board today, um, they didn't present any evidence from prior uh, assessments. So it's not really relevant to bring those up, especially since we couldn't question them, question them on it. Um, you know, one of the questions I asked was even the 2020 Prop 8 uh, review. He couldn't answer any questions on it because he said he never looked at it, didn't do it, didn't know anything about it. Um, I can't imagine if he didn't look at 2020's Prop 8 review, which was subject in this appeal, uh, one of the documents that was transferred, um, how detailed he went through the 2013 analysis. Um, he also uh, asked, mentioned a lot about the, uh, about the entity organization, um, whether he admitted it or not. He, he wanted to know what the setup was. I provided the org chart to him, and then uh, all of a sudden he forgot what an org chart was. Um, and so <clears throat> he has seen it before. Um, it's just, uh, I guess they have new market data now, but um, uh, they also said that they're trying their best to, quote, extract market data. Uh, we gave them like three or 400 line items of net operating income and expenses. They ignored all of it. Um, it's a little bit disingenuous to say that they had to try their best to find some market data somewhere when they had a year, three years worth of financials in front of them with hundreds of line items for each year that they were at a loss for information. They didn't use any of it. They used one number for each of those years, and they ignored all the other hundreds of line items. 
and their position is that a market participant would ignore the rents received from residents. We've never seen that before. They said themselves, they've never represented any buyers and sellers in this market. We have. We deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. Our clients exclusively try to figure out what the cash flows are gonna be from the residents and what the operating expenses are gonna be. They don't try to do um, what-if analysis on triple net lease agreements that don't exist from fictitious third parties um, and they especially don't put any value to payments that go out of one pocket and in another. Um, they, and they kept saying that they tried to apply market rent. We gave them the rent rule, listed market rents, target rates. It showed whether the residents were at or below target rates. They ignored all of it. Um, and they said that they were at a loss and trying to figure out somewhere they could find market rates and market rents. They didn't use the rent rule at all. Um, when I asked them if they reviewed it, yeah, we reviewed it and we didn't use it. Um, and, then, and then they say that they were at a loss for information. That's just simply not true. Um, uh, he also said they were forced to use what they had in front of them. Also not true. They didn't use most of what we gave them. They asked for income tax returns from the State Board of Equalization, or sorry, from the Franchise Tax Board. Um, didn't use it. Uh, the financials that we provided didn't use them. The rent roll we gave them didn't use it. Um, so, to the contrary, they weren't forced to use what they had in front of them. They actually did their best not to use what we gave them. Um, we gave them our analysis early on and told them what our positions were. At no point were they ever interested in looking at it um, and, and looking at what our issues were uh, three years ago when this, or sorry, two years ago when this appeal was filed. Um, uh, another issue, and it's the main issue, is our differences are clearly the, they're using a triple net lease payment. Whether one exists or not, we've gone over, there, there's no such economic transaction at this property. Um, and we've gone over Rule 8 and Rule 2 that says even if there is one, you're supposed to value it as if it's owner-occupied and look at the rents from the residents, look at the operating expenses, come up to a value, you're going to get a value that includes intangibles, and then deduct that value. We've shown that even before we make deductions for intangibles, their number is still millions of dollars higher. That doesn't, that can't, both cannot be true when they say that if you value the property, they said they ignored net operating because they wanted to avoid valuing and including the, the intangibles in the assessment. So then they did an analysis that came up to an even higher value. If this number includes intangibles and their conclusion is much higher that is, if, if the first number is wrong, they're both wrong. Um, we make deductions for intangibles to get to a lower number to deduct intangibles from the net operating income. Um, they also have a lease payment that's greater than the net operating income. Uh, they mentioned the prior year, but again, uh, in cross-examination, they never did any analysis to see whether their lease payments that they were using made any sense for the financials of the property. They mentioned 2018 and how there was a, how there was a profit. Um, I mentioned during our rebuttal when um, we were questioned about uh, you know, lease payments and such um, and for allocations for land purposes. Um, some counties use uh, a lease coverage ratio to figure out what portion should be applied to land. Uh, the 2018 number that they used, even though there might be a small you know, positive difference there, the lease coverage ratio is, I got it right here, 1.4. Uh, we've got CB, CBRE reports that say market lease coverage ratios are between three and five. So still, the lease on those, even though still not market, not between any third party, um, are still significantly higher than what actual market participants would be able to pay or be willing to pay when you've got a market that wants three to five times more net NOI than your lease payment. So the only positive number they could reference was a 1.4 lease coverage ratio. It's a far cry from three to five. And again, lease coverage ratio is taking the net operating income divided by the lease payment. You wanna know how much NOI you have compared to what your lease obligations are. Um, they also mentioned, um, oh, they actually made no mention that any of the residents as a whole were paying below market rates. Um, they said they got the, uh, the rent rule um, they had no evidence to show that they were being rented below market. Um, and so 
you know, they stated that they were trying to find anywhere, somewhere, some market rental rates. We gave them the, the unit rent and they didn't, they didn't like it, but they don't have any evidence that it was wrong um, or under-rented. Uh, they also mentioned that the market income could be, could be drastically different than the actual income. And we mentioned during their motion, yes, that's true for newly constructed properties that, have, uh, that, are, during, that are in lease-up. It is very common if you have a newly constructed property that's you know, got 10, 20, 30% occupancy for assessor's offices and taxpayers to assume, all right, what is the stabilized market income of this property? It's going to be drastically different than what the actual NOI is of the property because you know, if you did that, you'd, most properties that are in lease-up are worth nothing, and that's not the case. Um, so they, they kind of took that part out of context. Um, and they keep citing uh, you know, in Rule 8 that in State Board of Equalization that you're allowed to use market rents. We agree. The part they're leaving out is if you scroll down in Rule 8, uh, the encumbrance part. It says you can't, it says use market rents, don't use encumbrances. They skipped the second part, they used an encumbrance and they used a, a market rate of an encumbrance. You're not allowed to do either one of them. So they kind of skipped, skipped step two. Um, what we did, and you know, it's our burden of proof, is we followed rule eight. We looked at the net operating income, which was based on revenues that was received from residents in the property. Um, after operating expenses and then after making a number of Rule 8 deductions and then also trying to make the appropriate intangible deductions to follow uh, Rule 8 and Section 110 so that the assessment didn't include any intangibles. And that's what we did, and that's the actual revenue and cash flows that Well Tower receives. They don't receive a triple net lease payment. They receive the net operating income. And, yes, it fluctuates year to year. Um, that is one of the reasons why you can't just compare, you know, they made a, a stink about not comparing it to other properties. Every property is completely unique. You can't just say because one property is making X dollar amount, this property is going to also make X dollar amount. If that were the case, um, a lot of their properties should be doing much better, and they just don't because you have different circumstances in different markets and different locations, different demographics. It's just you don't get the same income at every property. You don't get the same expenses in every property. Uh, labor costs are higher in San Francisco and LA than San Diego uh, or you know in a different property in Nevada they talked about using national uh, properties or Texas or Florida or um, it's going to be much higher labor rates in New York does that mean that we should have the same labor rates in our analysis that New York and uh, San Francisco use no we're looking at the subject property um, so we use uh, net operating income did the capitalization um, and we followed Rule 8. We were compliant with all sections of Rule 8, not just portions of it. Um, and we believe that the, despite, oh, um, we believe our assessment, uh, sorry, our evidence supports the fact that the uh, fair market value for property tax purposes for the real property is less than the enrollment. I'd just like to make a quick comment on the assessor's rebuttal as part of our closing statement where the assessor's office said he didn't follow our methodology for the intangibles. We provided a complete copy of the Half Moon Bay case versus the County of San Mateo. I know the case real well, I know the attorneys real well, discussed it with them. In that case, um, Duff and Phelps did use a cost approach under FASB 141 to arrive at a cost for the building and the land, and he deducted those items from the total value he arrived at as a residual to the intangible values. That was overturned by the court. The court ruled against FASB 141 and that approach and came off and said that the assessor's office violated the standards prescribed by law because it failed to identify value and remove the value of the following intangible assets and rights from the hotel's income stream prior to capitalization. So it's pretty clear the court ruled favorably for the taxpayer, and that included the workforce um, as well as the, the uh, working capital. But it was deducting from the income to be capitalized. So the assessor's comment that our methodology is not tried and true or something new to him, we believe is without merit. Thank you. Okay. All right. At this point, we will close the hearing. And fellow board members, would you like to meet in closed session to discuss this with 
Council's guidance? Okay. We will take the testimony as in addition to the evidence under submission and we will discuss it with Council's guidance in closed session and you will be notified as to our ruling. And you will provide written findings of facts, correct? That is correct. Now are you intending on giving us your conclusion today? Obviously not the written findings, but your decision today. So I will inform you by email of a, the informal decision by the board as soon as they make it. So if they decide today, you'll know today they have 120 days under the law to make their final decision. Um, it will most likely take me the entire 120 days to issue the preliminary official decision, and then the findings of fact will follow 45 days later. Okay. So... Um, if now, board decides today, you'll have an email from me today. Thank you. Um, although it's 4 o'clock, so it might be <laughs> later in the week. Now, in other counties, both the county and the taxpayer write the findings of facts. So the county uh, board will prepare and provide the findings of fact. Your input will not be required. That's, that's great. <laughs> Thank you for the time, Thank season. you. Thank you to and the assessor. No. Okay. Thank you. No other agenda items. We there, are, no other items of business today. We are adjourned.